Excellent. All right, I will kick off now, please. Before I start, I would just like wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land, well, I guess I'm gathered at the moment and wherever you are virtually across the country. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so welcome to today's uh, workshop. We have a lot to get through. We did circulate an agenda, uh, I did send an agenda yesterday. Uh, and I, even just starting this, I'm very keen to acknowledge the enormous uh, in-kind and support from so many different people pulling it together, in particular the chairs of each of the different sort of groups as we move through. Um, we, this has been quite a journey over the last sort of, uh, since I think we mentioned in February and got things up and going. So thank you all very much for your uh, input as we go forward. So today is all about outlining what, what we've accomplished, outlining the draft standard and the program and where things are sort of seeing at the moment. Um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity following it. We'll be circulating the um, uh, the draft standard and uh, the PowerPoint as well. And we will be very much inviting and welcoming, welcoming feedback from everyone um, moving forward. But more to come very, very soon. So diving on into today's agenda, um, this is what we're going to be going through. Uh, we know we have got a lot squeezed in here and we're going to be keeping very close and um, tight to time as we move along. Um, as I mentioned, we every session we're very keen to make sure that there's uh, Q and A's after it, um, and we're and if you have comments, please chuck them into the chat, or you can hold them through, and then we can sort of throw them to each of the chairs as we uh, get to the end of the sort of sessions. Um, so, what we've sort of done at the moment, this is basically the mission goals um, and scope of uh, the Clock A, which we pulled together. So for those who are new or not, not aware, it's ensuring the safest construction vehicles journeys. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll probably re nuance it if required, but let us know. I mean, our goal is the Clock A is a national construction industry standard developed to ensure the safest, leanest, and greenest construction vehicle journeys. Um, and there's the list of the primary sort of goals. Uh, at, from the outset, I just want to highlight this is very much a systems-based approach in reducing the risk, so it doesn't land on any single sector or group. It's all about everyone working together to reduce the risk of um, construction journeys. And the other part is, is to probably create one of the key things I've learned around continuous improvement for the sector as well by all of us working together and moving forward. Um, this is the development of the timeline to date. As you can see, we kicked off in February. That's when we sort of established the various technical groups. And I know there's been such a broad range of uh, Wait, leadership. Still on me. Uh, if you can just mute microphones, please, that'd be great. Um, as you can see, there was a number of technical groups and behind all this consolidation group and uh, everything is sort of pulling everything together, which that's what we're sort of coming through today. And after this, we'll have a, a strong consolidation of the standard. There's also an audit and self-assessment process which has been developed over time. And that's what we'll sort of be mapping out today as we go forward. We'll also be showing a bit of a, the sustainability and governance um, and a number of tools that we're sort of been developing. The big goal out of this then, we'll be coming back and meeting in uh, March 23rd. We'll be, be tabling the, the final standard from everything that we've seen, the, um, the self-assessment um, and outlining, I guess, the sustainability membership model moving forward as well. Um, and then we'll be putting it out for expressions of interest um, to become the host and delivery of the program as it moves forward. Um, but we'll have a lot of that sort of stuff uh, very clearly mapped out, as you'll see as we go along today. Um, so we have accomplished a lot uh, and it was great just chatting with someone the other day and they they, they actually expressed how well um, things have been moving but it has been very much a, a collaborative effort with some fantastic inputs from everyone so thank you um the objectives of this project which came through and and it is has been uh, enabled through funding through nhvr through the heavy vehicle safety initiative program um, which is uh, is also funded through uh, the Commonwealth and from the NHVR. And for those of you who may not be aware or, or seen HVSI, it will be opening up uh, shortly and inviting applications for it. So you can certainly jump into the current round as it goes forward. Uh, so basically the objective of this project is to establish a national voluntary standard that draws on adapting the United Kingdom's world best practice um, and, and establishing a minimum requirement for the clock say standard. Um, and what it is, is is there's a number of projects, major uh, infrastructure projects that have been uh, been developed across the country. We're drawing on a lot of the inputs and how they've been adapting clocks to their sort of program and then creating it and rolling it into the Australian context. Because whilst uh, the UK is, is the model we're pointing to, there are significant difference between the UK and Australia. 
Um, and what's enabled this as a, as a core component is uh, MOU signed with Transport for London and clocks over in the UK, which has created the opportunity for open sharing and learning between us all uh, in moving forward and doing it. So uh, I've got to acknowledge the enormous support we have received from them and, and we sort of bi-monthly catch up with clocks. Um, we did that just on Monday night to walk through and that enabled a lot of us to move forward quite quickly in how we're doing and to problem shoot, how do you achieve this? What do you do here? Why do you do these sort of things moving forward? Um, and then vice versa, he's got questions and they've been sort of drawing and, and they're very keen to see what emerges out of this sort of program, which they can adapt into clocks over in the UK. So once again, it's all around collaboration and sharing as we move forward. So the deliverables as per the HVSI funding, um, we need to sort of look at creating a governance body. Um, so at the moment we have a memorandum of understanding um, which highlights the Clocks A champions and there's a broad number of organisations which have come into that and um, we have a, a steering group that's been taking it all forward and we've been meeting every month um, almost for two years now taking it all forward and that sort of evolved over time. We have to develop a program charter or agreement which will underpin it and that's what we'll begin developing following um, today's session. Um, and then the other part is, is then with the charter, as I mentioned earlier, is identifying the preferred host of delivering clock say, um, and I'll outline the at, towards the end of the governance structure and how we're sort of doing that. Um, we also have to establish a number of technical groups uh, that can flow through leading the various elements of the systems model um, that can go through. So there is the one to four, um, but the fifth one is the consolidation group, uh, which has been chaired and led by Michael Holmes, um, who's also the co-chair of the steering group. Um, what we have to deliver is the Clock Say standard, which is currently its draft form. Um, following this, uh, we will be outlining that and circulating it to everyone um, for comments, and we'll map that out as we get through towards the end on the process for that. Um, and it is also a snapshot in time um, for where it was. There's already been some feedback from some of the other technical groups which were documented, which will flow into, um, and we'll go through and wait till we've got all the feedback and then address it as it comes through. Um, we also have to do an engagement awareness campaign, um, which is under development. Um, we've got Swinburne University who we're working closely with in helping pull that together. And um, that's been sort of fed throughout a TG4 communications. Um, and the other deliverable we have is, is 10 clock say related um, case studies. Uh, we have the template lockdown, which aligns with what Sydney Metro has put into their contracts. Um, and we're developing them. We have one sort of finalized and I think another eight in, in the pipeline already. So they should come through. So. That is the deliverables as per the HVSI funding. Uh, so this just sort of maps out the clear timelines to showing how this is spread out over the 2022-2023. Um, oh, sorry, one little error in there. We actually we pushed it back a month from the National Consolidation Group. So, um, so we do have that. That's what the October 19th is actually today. Um, and then we've everything's sort of just back uh, an extra month on that one. So I do apologize. That's, that's an old slide. We have a, an updated one at the end of it, which we'll be just pointing to. Um, as I mentioned, as we're going through, and I have to acknowledge TG1, um, Merv Rollins, for pulling this slide together. Um, this is the big picture of the clock say standard, how it all comes together. As I mentioned, it's very much a systems based approach. Um, and it's all about reducing um, the hazard management for the interactions between vinyl road users around heavy vehicles. Um, and for those of you who may not be aware, uh, unfortunately, a heavy vehicle will always win against a vinyl road user, and it can be fatal even at 15 kilometres per hour. Um, and the big thing is really uh, on this is some, a lot of vinyl road users fail to understand how to interact safely around um, a heavy vehicle and the blind spots and those sort of components. And um, and it's vice versa as well. So it's getting them to understand the safety part, but then also the, the truck drivers to understand how to safely interact and being aware of, of what can go on, how to do that. So, and then creating the routes and those sort of components where they can take place. So um, the T, uh, the num number one sort of area, never have HV, uh, heavy vehicles or vulnerabilities in the same place at the same time. Um, or if we do, trying to reduce where that can occur as well. So making sure the logistics routes, those sort of components, can we, choose the safest route that may avoid schools, for example, other sort of hotspots or time of the day and those sort of things. How can we go through? And that's been led by TG3 um, Logistics, and you'll be hearing from Kim Hassel um, when he'll be talking through that as he's going forward. Um, the next one is, is around um, the second sort of one, ultra vigilant trains and focused sort of drivers. And each time as you're going down, it, it, obviously there's, there's less controls as you're going through. And Merv might just sort of touch on this when he kicks off in the next sort of TG1 
um, with Michael Chan um, on what DARPA achieved as they're going through, which will be the heavy vehicle standards. So the other one is ultra vigilant, trained and focused sort of drivers. And you'll be hearing from Michael Holmes, who's been leaving, leading TG2 around how the Clock A standard is going to be integrating, reflecting on what the law is, but then how can we raise the safety standard up for truck drivers? Um, so such that the risk of them being involved in a crash is is lowered because they're aware of them um, and dealing with potential ripple factor. Because uh, even though the, the two sides, A, want to reduce the risk that can happen, um, and even if they've done everything right and it's happened, the impact lasts for a long time and, and can spread through the community and organisations. So if we can do that, that's a huge success there as well. Um, the other one, next, the third one, is really looking at how we can use the most suitable HVs that serve um, to minimise the chances of, of incidents evolving. So what does the heavy vehicle standards look like? Um, how can we apply them to Australian trucks? Once again, and um, that Merv and Michael will touch on this, and just one of the simple things, which is hugely the difference between Australia and, and the UK, is we have trucks and dogs. The fact that we have trailers, and they just don't have them over in the UK. And that's just a very simple one of many differences. Um, between Australia and the UK, which which the group has had to take into account. And they'll walk you through those sort of standards. But the other part is, how do we also recognise that um, as part of this, it, it's a process of continuous improvement as new things come down the pipeline? How do we integrate them um, and doesn't put an unfair burden on the sector as well, but we can bring them along on the journey and give them the confidence to invest in the right sort of vehicles and be aware of what they have when, when they're doing their renewal. Um, and the last one then is, is TG4, and that's what I sort of chair with Martin Toomey from Arts or I. Um, and that's just making sure, once again, everyone is aware of how to safely interact and understand clock say and heavy vehicle safety. So uh, I know it's a bold effort. It's something the heavy vehicle sector has been trying to do for a long time to get people to understand how to inter interact safely with, with heavy vehicles. Um, and I think it's always a goal we can always strive for um, to go through in these sort of areas, because if we can accomplish anything like that, we've made a major step forward um, in a broader sense as well. So that's a big picture of illustrating how it all sort of pulls together. Um, what I'm going to do now is the next person stepping up will be Michael Chan, uh, Merv Rowland, and the group from, uh, and uh, Greg Dukranian and Chris Luce, who have been leading and pulling this all together um, in TG1. So. Um, over to you guys. <clears throat> okay, um, it's uh, Merv Rollins here. Thanks, uh, Jerome. I'll um, walk us through this uh, slide pack about uh, the heavy vehicle standards that we've come up with in uh, TG1. Um, but as Jerome mentioned, this group uh, includes uh, uh, Michael Chan, who's been the, the, the chair, and Chris Luce and Greg Ducranian, who've been uh, deputy chairs during the period. Um, <clears throat> so if you've got control, Jerome, can you just uh, scroll through as we're going? Before weary legs. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll run through is uh, the, the items here. We'll just go through some of the, the broader tasks that we've got for the TG1 group that are uh, in addition to just coming up with the, the various standards. As Jerome mentioned, there's a lot of differences between Australia and UK. So we're going to touch on that because that provides some of the rationale for, for the things that we've uh, that we've nominated here. Then um, we'll focus on the, the actual rationale for the standards more so than the standards, um, more of the, the why rather than the, the what. Uh, and we'll just finish up by looking at a uh, at the how we've grouped the um, the various standards into the three levels of uh, bronze, silver and gold. Uh, next one, please. Okay, so in addition to setting out just the vehicle standards that we'd like to see implemented on, on the trucks here, there are some other things that we need to be uh, you know, um, aware of. We need to be sure every standard provides a clear benefit and it's practical and, and doable. We, we don't wanna you know, put in things that are just uh, impossible to, to comply with. We needed to separate all the standards into the three different levels of bronze, silver and gold. Um, we need to identify which vehicles that we want to mandatorily uh, apply uh, or comply uh, and which vehicles can be exempt. So, you know, the, the, the tippers and the agitators that are that are just keep coming every day, we want to make sure all of these vehicles comply. The vehicles that might turn up once or, or twice for some big deliveries uh, can be exempt. 
We need to have procedures for accreditation and entry audits so that we can get the scheme underway. And we need a, a system of follow-up checks and policing to make sure that standards don't deteriorate um, over time. Um, we'd also like to prescribe some minimum vehicle maintenance standards to, to ensure that the vehicles, um, as well as complying with the clocks items, are otherwise safe. We want good, safe vehicles on our sites at all times. And we need to make the whole system um, as simple and as user friendly as, as possible, as you can imagine. Um, more so relating to the larger companies, the, the Wholesomes and the, the Hansons and so on, who've got a lot of their own systems and processes. We'd like to minimise duplication of those if it's at all possible. Um, and we need to make sure that it works for everyone and every size of transport operator. Um, not just focus on the big operators, but we need to make sure that the guys who are single owner operators uh, can also work within the scheme. Uh, next one, please, Jerome. So in, in terms of heavy vehicle standards uh, and the difference between Australia and UK, there's, there's, some, there's some fairly significant differences which serve to affect the measures we need to take. Um, a lot of what we're doing here uh, in terms of vulnerable road user safety relates to standards of direct vision. And almost all the trucks in the UK are cab over trucks, which have really good forward vision uh, ar around the truck. Uh, in Australia, we've got a very big mixture of bonneted and cab over trucks. Um, in the UK, there's very few large road train type trucks. In Australia, we've still got plenty of either extra road train trucks or sort of pseudo road train type trucks operating in the city and the suburbs. And we've all seen these truck and dogs with, with you know, chrome bits and pieces hanging off all over them. In Europe and the UK, we've got uh, far more advanced heavy vehicle design regulations. In, in Australia, our ADRs can lag behind Europe by a decade or more. And in some cases like ABS for trucks, 30 years we, we lagged behind um, the, the, the Europe. Now, I guess generally there's a bit of a different culture in Australia around, around what trucks look like. Um, there's a tendency for a, um, a lot of operators or drivers in Australia to want their trucks to look like you know, big American trucks and it's, it just, that just doesn't occur uh, in Europe. So we, we need to be able to deal with that. Uh, next one. Okay, so what we'll do is just work our way through the, the sort of the rationale for the different standards and the different groups of standards. So sort of focus on the, on the why. So in terms of our standards, we've divided into primary safety, secondary safety and the green standards the, relating to emissions. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of primary safety, we want measures to enhance the visibility and awareness of vulnerable road users to the truck driver. And we want measures to enhance the visibility and awareness of the trucks to the vulnerable road users. And then thirdly, measures that reduce the likelihood of a heavy vehicle being involved in an accident. In terms of the first group, uh, two different things here. We want to eliminate things that serve to reduce direct vision. And this relates to the type of trucks we were talking about just a moment ago. And then we want to implement measures that enhance indirect vision. So the, 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 the note here in the red is, we want the truck driver to be acutely aware of the presence, location, and probable next movement of the vulnerable road user. Um, so in terms of the, the standards that we've come up with for the first group, these are the things we want to get rid of. And they're sort of reflected a bit in this um, uh, photo here of the, of, of the, of the truck. So um, the things mentioned here are things that we don't want. So these are uh, bug deflectors on bonnets, you know, which can protrude up six inches at the front of a bonnet and really um, you know, create a problem for uh, vision in front of the truck. Uh, we don't want these big, tall chrome air intakes, which create blind spots either side of the, the, um, the windscreen. We don't want the big, large, inappropriate bull bars driving around in the, in the city. We don't want the big, solid sun visors that come a third of the way down the windscreen. We don't want decals on the windscreen, you know, with brand names and so on. 
Uh, we don't want illegal tinting in the, in the windows be beyond the, the, the norm. We don't want accessories which are bolted to the top of the, um, the dashboard, say, and create blind spots. So these are all things which don't really cost anything, but uh, they'll, they'll just need to be taken off the vehicles if they want to, if they want to comply in these schemes. Uh, next one, Jerome. So these are measures we want to take that enhance indirect vision. So these are things like the mirrors, and we can see the class, class five and class six mirrors there on the on the truck uh, in the photo. The forensal lens that we want on the passenger side window. We want either reversing cameras or reversing sensors at the back of the truck, and uh, left side blind spot cameras or left side proximity sensors on the on the left side of the truck. Um, in terms of uh, measures to enhance the visibility and awareness of the truck to the vulnerable road user, these are uh, audible or visible. And you know, we, this is where we want the vulnerable road user to be aware of the presence of the truck, the dangers associated with it and its likely next move. So it's all about awareness. It's the first group, uh, the audible uh, ones, Jerome. Um, so these are, you know, you'll have seen all these. So the, the audible alarms are the reverse beepers at the back of the truck. Um, and uh, what's fairly new, but the left turn audible warning. And you can see that's a, a, a uh, it's got two there, but that's a, a silver level requirement. In terms of the visible items, we want amber beacons up on the roof, the flashing beacons, and they've been around for decades in Australia. Day run lights, uh, conspicuity marking on the sides of the truck, that's the retro reflective striping. And uh, to do, help deal with truck and dogs, uh, we want the draw bars to be a, a bright colour like yellow, like you can see in, the, in the, uh, the photo there. And we want warning signage at the back of um, all of the, uh, the trucks and trailers to warn of the, the, the left side blind spot danger. <clears throat> in terms of things to reduce the likelihood of a, a truck being involved in an incident at all, we've got uh, wheel nut indicators to help reduce the likelihood of a wheel off event. Uh, we've got anti-lock braking system for trucks and trailers, telematics, we've got electronic stability control for trucks, roll stability for trailers, advanced emergency braking, lane departure warning, and autonomous reverse braking. And you can see all the latter ones, they're all gold level ones. Um, and uh, you'll see a bit later on as well that to get gold level, you don't need everything. But, uh, but a selection of those. The uh, secondary safety things for us all relate to underrun protection. So we've got front, side and rear underrun protection. They all come at the silver level. And we'd also like to see the side underrun protection, um, you know, take advantage of that real estate with, with more conspicuity marking and, and warning signs that, that you can see as an example in the photo there. The last group in terms of uh, green standards, uh, Jerome, if you can go to the next one. Um, so these are things to help reduce the production of harmful emissions. So we've got Euro 5 emission standards, which come in at the silver level and at the gold level, we've got Euro 6 or zero emission vehicles. And they're just starting to come in as you can uh, be aware. And the, there's a, a photo there of uh, the, the one of the new Volvos that are about to hit the market in Australia. I think that's the, uh, the FL. Okay, the last uh, slide here. This is a summary of how we've grouped the different uh, items or standards into the three different levels into bronze, which we call the must haves, the silver are the should haves and the, the gold, I guess, are the nice to haves. Um, what, what I've just tried to show here is uh, what we've got versus what appears in the, the UK clock standards. And where there's a cross there, it doesn't mean that they don't want it. What it means is that, that uh, in the clock system, it's just silent on it, so it doesn't refer to it at all. But you can see the first uh, six, seven or eight items in the bronze level. These are all things that we just uh, uh, want eliminated from a truck's which don't really need to be eliminated in, in uh, the UK or Europe because they typically don't have them at all. So we're just trying to deal with some, uh, I guess, um, Australian peculiarities of, of, of some of the vehicles here. Um, at the silver and the gold level, uh, you can see all the items 
um, in the in the clocks row, which I've nominated as being European law. So these things um, have been required by law in Europe, um, you know, either recently or for a very long time. And if they're required by law, then there's no need to prescribe them in a clock system because the trucks are just going to have them anyway. So whilst it looks like we've got a great deal more items uh, in the clocks uh, system, um, that's because um, they're not required here by law and we'd like them to be, uh, depending on, on, on the level. And you see in the last group, the gold, um, what we, to, to get uh, accreditation to a gold level, what we want is uh, telematics as mandatory, uh, plus at least four of, of the remaining seven items. Um, so rather than go on with that anymore, we might um, wind it up there and then um, just wait for uh, questions to uh, to help explain what we've what we've done. Jerome, awesome! Thank you for that, Merv. I think that was an absolutely fantastic summary. And I guess one of the things take take home I take uh, look at it straight away is when you look at this sort of standard and to your point around what's in European law and what's not and. One of the things that pops up, especially in the road safety community, is, is things around the site underrun protection, as an example. And I, I think one of the interesting things on this is, is this provides the avenue to address some of those concerns, because obviously Europe, European cities a lot more urbanised, trucks will interact a lot more with cities, so it makes a lot more sense. This provides the avenue for actually making the case for it to go into those in sort of similar sort of areas in um, Europe. Would, would that be fair? <clears throat> Yeah, that, that that's right. There's a there's a you know sort of a, from my point of view quite a significant difference. Sorry, we just got a um, Anne von Walter. Would you mind just muting your microphone, please? Thank you. Sorry, move. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> we we we. we the, the, the trucks of the situation that we're dealing with uh, between Europe or the UK and, and here is the, the difference is quite significant. So I guess we're, we're trying to um, bring things up to <clears throat> to a minimum standard that already exists in Europe, partly because of the, you know, the nature of their trucks and they all cab overs, they're small, they don't have, uh, you know, truck and dogs running around in the city all the time. They don't have a lot of the, um, you know, the sort of, trucks at the crazier end with all this uh, chrome and <clears throat> giant air intakes and bull bars and bug deflectors and all this sort of thing driving around uh, in the city like we do. So we've kind of, we, we've got to try to normalise that situation um, and, and deal with things that are um, already dealt with by law in, in, in Europe. So, you know, at a, at a glance, you know, 36 items versus nine items looks a massive difference. Um, but, but we're trying to deal with a very different situation. Excellent. I've got a question there from David. <clears throat> Hello, David. You're on mute, just in case you didn't realise. Sorry about that. Uh, thank, thanks, Merv. I noticed that you have in there um, an option being that the vehicle is a zero emission vehicle for the gold standard. Uh, I just want to check if that's going, part of that is a requirement for an acoustic vehicle alert system. It's obviously, those trucks will run quieter. I'm not exactly sure how much quieter they are compared to electric cars, mm. but yeah, was there any thought given to that? Um, pro probably not, to be honest. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of experience with full electric heavy vehicles uh, at this point in time. Um, I don't know how how silent they they are going to be, mm. um, yep. you know, compared to a normal truck or compared to uh, an electric uh, uh, passenger vehicle. I certainly get it. Uh, I was surprised yesterday uh, when when I when I come across a, a hybrid car in a in a car park that that I that I couldn't hear, but it but it, you know it's certainly an, an important point, and I guess um, you know when we've got a bit more of experience with with uh, what they're like. I guess when they're moving, um, you know, road noise and tyre noise and that sort of thing may be significant, but when they're uh, sitting in an intersection, um, you know, you may not be able to hear a single thing. So a, a, a yep. good point. Um, and, and, and we, uh, you know, we may get some feedback uh, from Europe, you know, 
um, that we can take advantage of because they'll no doubt uh, have a lot more of those before we do working in the city. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just adding to that, there is a, a proposal under the ADRs to uh, mandate you know EVs to to make some form of noise at low speed, and that'll align with international standards. Generally, yeah, like like what Merv was saying in, in the low speed set them they may be very quiet for light vehicles heavy vehicles i think may, may make a bit i suspect may make a bit more noise uh but uh once you sort of surpass you know 30 k's or 25 k's the the tire noise and the wind noise it takes over anyway yeah, yeah. so it's no different to uh, convention conventional um, trucks but yeah good point yeah. thanks no worries. thanks michael thanks Murph. I must have been straight away. Great work. Like you can see, we've got the right people leading leading the group. So thank you, Mike and Mike for that. Like, and and it has actually been um, some of the topics of discussion for the steering group around where does that environmental and those sort of um, emissions sit with this. And um, our scope has been very clear on the safety, and um, that's what the remit is for the funding of the project. With um, the next, the future may be as it evolves forward is, is capturing more of those environmental elements as it moves forward. But the other part is, I think it's a win-win. Um, safety will actually, the two are quite closely interlinked anyway. Uh, Chris, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want to add anything at all, Chris Luce? Uh No, Michael covered off the issue of acoustic vehicle alerting systems being evolving under the ADR, so thank you. Any other questions or, or concerns or thoughts um, i think they've done a fantastic job in mapping out the sort of process uh what will come from this is, is um uh what will come through from this is i guess a, a risk-based approach as to how you apply the different sort of standards moving forward as well so that'll be a bit of a, a work in progress as the next sort of stage um i just saw a, qu a chat question come through um from anthony uh is there a reason telemax not considered as a must-have and was dash cams ever considered It, it, yeah, we, we've got telematics as mandatory at uh, a, a gold level. Um, we, 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 I think we noted from one of the other groups, Michael, that uh, that they were looking to make telematics uh, mandatory anyway, j just in 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 the scheme, um, and not um, not from the sort of truck standard point of view, but fr from one of the other uh, groups' point of views. Uh, we we put that in there, and I guess we're waiting to to, to see. We didn't um, we didn't kind of want to make telematics absolutely mandatory for every vehicle right at the bronze level, um, uh, 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 you know, straight off the bat. But if if the other groups or or the the you know the uh, the wider group for um, clock say wants to make telematics mandatory, then then um, then I, then, I, then I guess they can. It was just, you know, there's there's a cost. It's also a little hard to define um, telematics. You know, there there are systems that range from very very simple to very very expensive. Um, and um, how do you define it when you've got telematics or not? It's got to have a minimum sort of functionality. Um, and what is it that you're after with telematics um, that that you want to see here? A, a little it was it was a little hard to define to be honest that's right um yeah exactly uh, adding to what Merv was saying in, in when the uh, tg1 considered telematics there was there was a broad range and a very uh, rudimentary simple <coughs> devices that plugs into your audio b to very sophisticated devices that that you can sort of um uh, map out where the heavy vehicles travel um and so on and so forth so we're guided by the other uh working groups at the moment um, at the moment particularly the logistics planning group where if they want to track um the vehicle where they're using what routes they're using then that'll stream uh, that will flow into our stream work stream here but um from a you know vehicle safety itself i think telematics doesn't uh, provide us with much at this point Dash so, cam is the other one. Um, we hadn't considered that, have we, Merv? I, I don't think um, uh, dash cam sort of uh, would probably assist the driver in in the, in, the, in, in helping him drive safer or road users, but it does sort of provide a footage recording when things do go wrong. 
But um, I don't think we've actually debated on that feature, did we, Murph? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's it's a little complicated uh, th that area, and um, you know you you can um, come into some difficulties in there. The 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 notion of of uh, dash cams and cameras, which um, you know really record what happened rather than prevent something, um, as you know the the sort of their their use is debatable in terms of. Uh, preventing accidents versus helping you investigate accidents and I've got a lot of you know experience um, in that area myself and certainly with uh, with Boral in Queensland um, where they ended up putting in very sophisticated camera systems with three or four cameras on the trucks you know one's looking forward one's looking backwards One's mounted on top of the um, the external mirror mounts that both look backwards down the side of a truck, um, and also a camera inside the cabin pointed at the driver, and that's really the critical one in terms of prevention. So the other cameras are great. Um, you can investigate um, a serious heavy vehicle accident, you know, in about twenty seconds now instead of you know months of work. So they they're really great from that point of view. Um, but but the, the, the big thing is, um, you know, if you've got a fleet of drivers and um, you can successfully get it past them, that you can have the camera in the cab looking at the driver all the time recording what he's doing, that's a massive step forward because um, any worker, whether they're a driver or something else, if they know they're being monitored, it changes behaviour, absolutely changes behaviour. Um, the difficulty is, you know, we couldn't mandate that here because we know that, um, you know, getting it past drivers or groups of drivers or unions, that you're going to have uh, a camera in the truck recording what the driver does all the time is fairly problematical. So we wouldn't pretend to, to put that in here as a standard. But, uh, but is it, it's an extremely valuable tool if you're in a position um, to, to, to do so. Um, just a, a dash cam facing forward um, on its own. There's there's a um, there's there's a little bit of sort of a sense of monitoring and, and changing behaviour there, but not a not a lot. It's it's mostly for investigating an incident after it's happened rather than preventing one in the first place. Thanks for that, Mervyn. Um, and we will, as you can see, there's consolidation to go through and, and we welcome feedback when we put the standard out as to where some of those parts should be sitting as well. That'd be great. Last question. Um, so we've got basically one minute to go before we move on to the next one. Was there any consideration of fatigue alerts or management in, when you went through this? Um, yeah, I, you know, we try to consider, consider all of these things, but um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a funny science and, and uh, my experience is, is quite expensive. You know, there are some systems now, I'm trying to think of the, the, the names of them, um, you know, which monitor, um, you know, driver's behaviour and blinking and, you know, looking out the window and, and all of these things, which, which are great, but they are you know, um, quite expensive uh, systems still these days. We've we've been looking at it for, for for years in the in the company that I was working for, but really struggled to ever justify it because of the on the ongoing cost. You know, maybe it's something that could come in um, at a at a, at a gold level at, at at some point in terms of a, a nice to have if we think we can have a system that we could define um, in terms of what it's what it's you know function or operability um, you know <clears throat> I've got a, a, a personal um, belief particularly in relation to um, heavy vehicles working in the city um, that fatigue is perhaps not the, 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 the cause of accidents that we think it is but focus and attention and, and um, you know concentration on the road and what you're doing as opposed to being, you know, dis distracted or, or, or looking elsewhere or not concentrating, that for me um, is 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 the biggest cause of accidents. Particularly, moreover, in the city when you, you know you're dealing with traffic and vulnerable road users, you know, it's how alert you are, 
whether you're, you know, you're, you're, you're looking out for. I've, moved. I've, I've, I've just got to jump in now. So we're going to begin moving on to the next one. So, but thank you very much for that. And just, uh, uh, well, Kathy, I'll hold yours through to the general discussion. Guys, fantastic presentation, fantastic work. Thank you so much for the leadership on this. Um, one quick thing on the fatigue um, element, just moving forward to let everyone know, um, there is a project undergoing at Monash where they're reviewing 82 fatigue technologies, um, actually at the coal face to see what sort of, whether it's actually doing, so it could be an evidence-based approach as well as to what works, cost effectiveness as well. So thank you, Merv, for that. Great work, mate. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Greg, and Chris as well. So, um, what we'll do now is we're now transitioning on to the next TG2, um, and I'll be handing over to Michael Holmes to do that. And I'll take those other questions through to the end. Thank you, guys. Great. Thanks for that, Jerome. And yeah, thanks, Merv. That was um, yeah, a great summary of the work from Technical Group One on the heavy vehicle standards. Um, so yeah, just uh, my, my name's Michael Holmes. Um, I'm uh, currently the chair of the technical group two, which is focusing on the driver safety standard, uh, uh, part of the Clox A uh, overarching standard. Um, and uh, basically, I'm not sure if oh, I don't have control of the slides. Yeah, I might. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jerome. Yeah, so um, basically, the, the purpose of um, our technical group. Um, was basically um, established to develop the overarching training and competency standards, which would um, be part of the Clocks A standard. Um, these would be designed to provide heavy vehicle drivers with the knowledge, skills, motivation to operate heavy vehicles safely in diverse road environments and share the road safely with vulnerable road users, as, as well as develop empathy um, for vulnerable road users. In addition to that, the group also looked at minimum standards as well for ensuring fitness for duty and safe driving behaviours in the construction industry. I might go to the next slide. Thanks, Jerome. So um, our, our group was quite diverse in terms of its representation. We had members from uh, road safety user groups, uh, from industry, from transport operators, um, from uh, construction principal contractors, as well as government clients uh, and uh, road safety research um, uh, consultants and uh, scientists as well. Um, so. Um, we had quite a representation um, ranging from uh, both drivers, driver trainers, as well as safety and compliance managers, um, government clients, um, and in the research space as well. Um, so I, I do want to um, just acknowledge um, all the people that have contributed to the development of um, the draft uh, driver safety requirements to date. Um, but yeah, without the, the time um, that uh, everyone has put into um, the monthly meetings um, over the past um, however long it's been, nine months now. So um, it's it's been uh, quite a tremendous effort. So I do appreciate um, everyone's input into um, this standard. Um, so next slide, thanks, Jerome. Um, so our deliverables um, as part of technical group two was to um, develop, as I mentioned before, the driver safety requirements component, which um, will form part of the Clox A standard. So all of the elements that you're seeing today um, will, will basically feed into the overarching Clox A standard. Um, and that will be, uh, I think there was a couple of questions around whether that will be made available. Um, so that draft standard will be um, sent out um, following this um, workshop today um, and will be up for consultation. Um, so uh, our deliverables as well as part of um, drafting these requirements was to identify current existing training courses and units of competency, which would meet the training and competency standards proposed by the group as well as share existing units of competency standards, including um, industry-based training as well, with the technical group for review and comparison. Um, so we understand that they're not just accredited units, but there are um, good industry-based um, training um, out there, which are delivered in-house by certain companies, um, as, as well as um, uh, different RTOs as well, deliver training which might not be accredited, but does um, stand up and address um, the issues that we are, are wanting to solve here. Um, our last deliverable, which we are, are going to be working on going forward, as well as uh, the development of um, supporting tools, which will be uh, basically released to assist industry to communicate hazards and risks and um, assist in uh, achieving compliance with the standard. Uh, so next slide. Thank you, Jerome. So um, in terms of uh, drafting the driver safety standards, um, a number of I guess starting from um, the formalization of our, our group's terms of reference to agree on, on what the group's deliverables would be. Uh, we then uh, drafted a consultation paper um, summarizing key issues um, faced in the industry and on, on projects um, in relation to 
um, uh, this this specific um, uh, issue of vulnerable road user safety and um, construction vehicle um, movements on on infrastructure projects. Um, these issues and themes were uh, circulated to the group for um, discussion. Um, we then established subgroups within the technical group to have focused workshops and discuss those issues and themes um, at more depth and identify which areas would need to be considered for the actual driver safety standard. Um, following um, those breakout workshops, we did collect um, the outputs from um, the, the subgroup workshops um, for the wider technical group to then review um, these outputs um, in terms of uh, what you know the benefit, justification, um, any risks um, and weaknesses of those requirements, um, and where they would sit in terms of a bronze, silver, gold um, level standard, um, similar to what um, uh, Technical Group One had uh, proposed, um, and that was uh, circulated for con consultation this year um, uh, within the Technical Group. Um, in terms of that consultation, uh, basically um, we, we also uh, discussed not only each uh, proposed requirement, but also um, looked at it through the lens of industry application and achievability. So the importance of having um, different um, industry representatives in the group um, uh, made us able to um, see whether um, certain standards were being achieved currently um, uh, uh, by different transport operators. Um, as well as um, the gold level standards, um, how difficult they would be able to achieve um, going forward. Um, and finally, um, yeah, we, we produced a draft um, requirements for the Clock A standard, um, which will uh, form part of the um, uh, standard that'll be circulated following this workshop. And I'll go through what um, those requirements are in the next couple of slides. So um, just a bit of, uh, again, um, our rationale behind um, the driver safety standards. Um, in terms of um, uh, looking at, uh, I guess, the requirements and where they would sit um, within the standard, we, we had a look at the National Transport Commission's definition of what it means to be a safe driver. Um, and they defined um, that as um, a safe driver is one who is competent, fit for duty, authorised, alert and operating safely. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, thanks, Jerome. We basically packaged that up into four core themes um, and defined uh, or came up with our definition for a safe driver, which um, aligns with that uh, NTC de definition, being one that is authorised, trained and competent, fit for duty, um, and displays safe behaviours and culture. Um, the fit for duty um, uh, component um, uh, also encompasses the alertness um, uh, definition in the NTC um, uh, definition. So we, we like to uh, see that fit, fitness for duty um, encompasses um, fatigue management as well. Um, so I'll go through what those standards um, basically were, and I hope you can see apologies if that is a bit bit small. There's quite a bit to this. Um, so just on this slide, um, we break down what those requirements um, look like um, and which you'll see when the when the draft standards circulated. Um, in, in terms of the safe driver um, standards under authorization, um, we are proposing uh, requirements for um, basically heavy vehicle drivers um, the obvious thing being um, that they are appropriately licensed for the class of vehicle which they are engaged to operate. Um, so this is something that uh, a process needs to be able uh, needs to be in place to ensure that drivers that are engaged, um, whether as, as employees or um, subcontractors, um, can be able to demonstrate that they have the appropriate class of license for the vehicle which they are operating. Um, in addition to that, um, the standard does talk about um, having a process to verify the license periodically as well. Um, so throughout um, you know, the, the duration of um, employment um, and uh, when a driver's uh, license is up for renewal, there is a process in place to be able to check that that um, driving license has, um, has been renewed um, and um, any conditions are accounted for, et cetera. Um, when we move to the training and competency um, section of the standard, this does make up um, uh, yeah, a, a little bit more of the, of the standard. So um, we, we agreed as, as a group that there needs to be a training needs analysis um, in place. Um, so for um, Clock A accredited parties um, to demonstrate competence, uh, sorry, uh, compliance to the Clock A standard, they would need to have a, a training needs analysis um, in place, which basically um, demonstrates that they are looking at the skills gaps um, that exist within their workforce and what, what training and competencies are required for heavy vehicle drivers to be able to undertake their job safely um, when uh, working um, for, for that operator. 
In addition to that, the um, group has also proposed a, a minimum suite of um, uh, uh, competencies, and those are basically um, the following competencies listed in um, here, which range from low risk driving skills, and the standard will define what um, uh, what that um, actually involves. There are a number of um, courses out there, previously called defensive drive, um, now moving towards um, terminology such as low risk driving behaviors or safe um, heavy vehicle driving behaviors. Um, and um, a lot of these skills as well are featured in um, uh, government transport department, um, uh, heavy vehicle driver handbooks, etc. Those low risk driving skills um, include things such as buffering, um, uh, speed control, road positioning, etc., um, and hazard identification and awareness. Um, in addition to that, and uh, a core uh, competency of the CLOCKS A standard is a vulnerable road user awareness um, uh, competency as well. And I'll go through um, in uh, the next couple of slides um, where we've broken down different tiers of um, uh, of this uh, competency um, from bronze, silver, gold. Um, so the purpose of the vulnerable road user awareness competency is to ensure that heavy vehicle drivers understand um, how to operate heavy vehicles safely um, and be able to anticipate um, common um, hazardous scenarios when on the road, uh, sharing the road with vulnerable road users um, and understand the different behaviours of different types of vulnerable road users ranging from pedestrian cyclists and motorcyclists, but also to those um, that may, uh, may be impaired as well, um, such as um, elderly, um, or um, uh, persons um, with a disability. Um, in addition to that, the group has, a, has also um, uh, proposed that um, a, a minimum competency in load restraint, uh, loading and unloading of heavy vehicles um, is, is a key to this as well. Um, it's not just the vehicle, but it's also the load that can impact the safety of vulnerable road users, um, uh, particularly in the construction sector. Um, I know a lot of the focus of um, construction projects and um, particularly with um, this discussion today is, is regarding tippers and concrete agitators, but there are a lot of different construction um, vehicle types that operate on, on our projects ranging from flatbed trucks to semi-trailers that are carrying loads that um, may be um, yeah, completely different and restrained in a completely different way um, to that um, uh, that of a tipper. Um, so it's very, very important that um, this competency is also included. Um, another reason why we um, have proposed this is that it was um, called out in um, Osroad's 2018 review of the heavy vehicle driver um, uh, competency framework that uh, load restraint was an area that um, wasn't touched on um, uh, to uh, a great deal. Um, in addition to that, um, we are proposing that a competency in fatigue management um, is also included um, as part of the training and competency standards. Um, so this is um, essential, obviously, from a safety perspective, but also from a compliance perspective as well with the um, requirements for standard hours um, under the um, heavy vehicle national law. Um, and in addition to that, we, we have proposed a minimum competency in undertaking a proper pre-start inspection of a heavy vehicle um, and what is involved in looking for defects um, around the vehicle um, and uh, looking at the minimum safety equipment um, as well that is required to be on that vehicle, the positioning of it, the condition of it as well. And the last competency um, that the group decided on was um, breakdown safety as well. This came in um, following the discussion that heavy vehicle drivers themselves can be vulnerable road users, um, particularly in the case of a vehicle breakdown um, uh, when they are in that, that vulnerable position um, in live traffic. Um, so um, it was important that we included that within the scope of this um, standard. Um, if we move on to the fitness for duty um, standards, um, the uh, TG2 is proposing um, within the standard that a pre-employment medical um, checking uh, or pre-employment medical process is in place um, for um, operators to ensure that drivers are um, uh, fit for um, the tasks that, that they have to undertake and that any health conditions um, have been accounted for and can be managed um, during their course of employment. Um, the standard also will call out um, a requirement for periodic medical checks to be undertaken as well. Um, this will be aligned to Osroads um, assessing fitness to drive standards. Um, in addition to that, um, drug and alcohol uh, policy and test program um, is being uh, 
proposed, as well as a fatigue management policy and program. So these um, requirements are legal requirements, um, and we will not be specifying um, how they need to look, um, but that a uh, that a policy and program will need to be in place. Um, the safe behaviours and culture um, area. So um, we basically looked at this was around um, driving behaviours and instilling um, not just safe um, behaviours, but also professionalism as well. Um, we want the drivers working on these projects to be um, the professional drivers that they're engaged to be. Um, so uh, the standard will be proposing um, a code of conduct um, slash safe driving policy. Um, uh, in addition to that, a mobile phone use and in-cab distraction policy. Um, following on from that, um, the standard will require regular communication and consultation with the workforce on risks, hazards, and uh, ways of controlling those hazards, as well as any lessons learned as well that come from the wider industry that can be shared with um, uh, uh, different um, uh, operators um, and their own supply chain. Um, we will utilise a lot of the work, um, particularly through the NRSPP as well, um, with the recent um, Heavy Vehicle Toolbox Talk program as well, and be looking at sharing that with um, our Clock Say members. Um, and the last um, standard as part of BRONZE is to um, have a process in place to monitor driving standards and behaviours. As we move up into the silver um, standards, you can see a, a, a couple of additional items have been included, as well as the Vulnerable Road User Awareness um, Training Module has been um, uh, moved into what we term as the immediate um, training requirements. Um, so we will be expecting a bit more from that course in terms of its um, delivery and the assessment requirements. Um, uh, under Fitness for Duty, um, there will be a requirement um, to have in place a health and wellbeing program where proactive measures are being put in place to monitor um, the health of um, and wellbeing of drivers, um, not just from that pre-employment side of things, but from the ongoing physical and mental health um, of the driver workforce. Um, under the safe behaviours and culture, um, uh, the standard will be calling for a driver reward and recognition program. So this is about um, recognizing and incentivizing safe behaviors and reinforcing um, basically the, the positive um, that um, we see in, in our organizations and praising that. Um, if you go forward, Jerome, I think the next one's the gold standard. So as we move up into gold um, standard accreditation, the vulnerable road user awareness course requirements will um, be a bit more rigorous in terms of their expectations for practical, um, uh, a practical component to be able to um, uh, essentially uh, physically feel and see um, road conditions and from the perspective of vulnerable road users. So we do see courses such as the Safe Urban Driving Program in the UK, as well as Sharing Road Safely um, in Australia, um, where drivers are given that opportunity to firsthand experience um, road conditions and um, the uh, perspective of the vulnerable road user. Under the Fitness for Duty um, uh, standard, um, uh, a requirement is being proposed around um, considering and undertaking an investigation of the workplace design and undertaking an analysis of the tasks that the heavy vehicle driver has to undertake. This could include assessing blind spots around heavy vehicles, um, workplace layout such as cab um, uh, design, where, where um, uh, controls are, the positioning of um, in-vehicle units, that sort of thing, and how that can be optimised to improve the safety of the driver when undertaking that task. Um, in addition to that, the monitoring and driving standards um, uh, requirement um, uh, will be up is upgraded in in the gold standard, um, and that will require um, the use of um, basically data and technology to uh, to uh, both uh, monitor but also um, coach and train in driving behaviours. So this is where um, going on from the previous discussion around telematics. Um, this is where um, telematics data will will feed into, um, as well as things such as um, uh, uh, dash cams and um, uh, driver cameras as well. Um, so that's uh, basically an overview of what the standard looks like. Um, I do have a slide as well additionally just to talk about um, the vulnerable road user training uh, modules and what, what is being proposed around the bronze, silver, gold um, standard. So I just um, due to time, I won't go through everything here, but we've, we're basically separating um, the uh, acceptable delivery methods as well as the um, extent of the knowledge content um, criteria, which is um, 
uh, required for that bronze, silver, uh, gold accreditation. So as you progress up, um, basically more rigorous assessment um, requirements um, will be um, expected for that um, particular course. So um, if RTOs are designing a course, um, they will be um, having to meet that um, particular standard and that will be reviewed by the clocks a managing body um, there will also as i mentioned before there will also be requirements around um, uh, for the gold standard to um, undertake a practical component and um, that could include a site visit involving walking tours of project haulage routes um, or an on bike tour and experience um, all of these courses will be required to train um, drivers in an understanding of the minimum vehicle safety technologies, um, which were um, uh, just presented by technical group one as well, so that drivers understand obviously the purpose and function of those technologies and as well as the limitations as well. Uh, next slide, thanks Jerome. Yeah, so next steps um, with um, technical group two is um, obviously um, the consultation with the wider Clocks A community. So as I mentioned at the start, this will be shared um, with the community for um, uh, consultation and comment and feedback um, as, as well as um, uh, industry associations. Um, the vulnerable road user um, uh, training course as well, um, technical group two will be drafting the minimum knowledge and skills criteria that is expected for um, course providers um, to meet as well as um, we will be developing the, the bronze um, uh, module um, as part of an e-learning module. So that will be made available to um, operators who at least want to sign up to the bronze um, standard of Clocks A, um, and that will be accessible um, on the website. Um, in parallel with this, we will also be um, developing a number of supporting tools and guidance as well to help operators achieve um, the, uh, the Clocks A standard. Thank you. Fantastic job, Michael. I think you squeezed a hell of a lot into your, into your time parcel. So um, two questions and great support from industry and pulling it together. So thank you. Thank you and what you've actually accomplished there. So first question here is from Thomas. And you, um, how do the load restraint maintenance and fatigue standards integrate with the NHVAS accreditation modules? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we did um, look at the NHVAS um, accreditation modules. Um, my understanding is that load restraint isn't a isn't an accreditation um, module. Um, however, the maintenance and, and fatigue um, standards are. We have um, managed to um, in the standard in which you'll see when when that's sent out, um, the language is written in a way that um, is able to um, align with the fatigue um, uh, accreditation um, requirements. So, I believe there's a there's a course requirement under fatigue management as well as the um, uh, the uh, pre-employment medical um, requirement as well. So there is um, general overlap between that. From a maintenance perspective, um, that's sort of a question for both, um, I'd say both TG1 and, and um, our technical group. Um, the maintenance side of things, um, the uh, expectations for um, uh, heavy vehicle um, pre-start inspections um, will be obviously aligned with um, the NHVAS um, accreditation um, requirements around that. Um, but we are also, um, and again, I, I won't go into too much detail um, because this is being worked on by TG1, but um, there will be an expectation within in the standard as well to have a maintenance management system um, by, uh, that the operator um, should have in place. So um, there is general alignment um, between um, the existing NHVAS accreditation requirements. Great. Thank you, Michael. This is common there, just saying load restraint is a module in WA, so I think we'll just have to draw that in and check off on that. Um, Robin's question, is there an expectation that these courses will need to be externally run or will you be able to develop your own internally? Yeah, so the expectation is that, um, well, there will be um, a, a requirement um, for the course to, and the competency to be achieved. Um, we, we won't dictate um, whether it's done externally or internally, um, it, it will just be able to uh, be able to demonstrate um, that it meets an industry recognised standard. We will list accredited units um, as well, um, but those those won't be mandatory at this stage. Um, but happy to take feedback as well from the, the community on that too. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Any other questions at all? But I think that spectacular job on a on a rather complex task. So uh, last question, we got Thomas. Um, where's Thomas's one in the chat? Thanks. Thanks, Jerome. Mike, Michael, thanks. Great.
great work, just probably on the yep. back end with the um, with the recognition of um, those training modules, particularly yep. for workplace owners and, and construction project owners. You know, it's probably something that's that's worth escalation around that commonality, so that we're not ending up with, um, you know, five or six or seven or fifty different variations of the same training that drivers are having to go through when yeah, they're being definitely. onboarded to jobs. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I, I think um, a lot of the training um, standards, when we discussed this with um, the group, um, these were being done whether in-house and they met um, basically the performance standard. Um, the only course that we do see um, that will need a bit more focus is the vulnerable road user specific awareness course, um, purely because um, after doing um, the review of the existing courses, um, there aren't a whole lot of providers out there. So hence why we are looking at um, creating something for Clocks A, um, which will support operators to be able to, to um, gain that competency. Thanks, Michael. We're just about to move on the last one, but before we do, um, Robin's just looking for a clarification. So does that mean we will need to be RTO approved? Back to your previous um, discussion. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, um, I don't have the answer to that um, at this stage. Um, I think we, we need to discuss that um, going forward. I, I, I wouldn't say, um, yeah, that, that, that would be the case at this stage, but um, yeah, that's still up for discussion with the, with the technical group. So. Right. Fantastic, Mark. Once again, I think your praise to yourself and to your, um, all the members of your technical group for the work that have done and taken through this um, path forward and, and be really interesting to see what sort of feedback we get from everyone when we put it out as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jerome. Okay, now we're moving over to Kim. Um, are you ready to go, Kim? You're just, and we'll, he will be leading us through uh, what's been done for the logistics and planning component of TG3. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I'm sorry my camera's not working. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you well, Kim. Great job. Oh, that's all right. I've also um, <laughs> got a plumber in the background drilling a hole in the wall, so um, bear with me. Um, I have plumbing problems sometimes when they end up presenting with blocks. But anyhow, um, this is the second time that's happened. Anyhow, look, um, um, we're the, uh, I suppose, a bit of an overarching group um, because obviously our group touches on a little bit on vehicles, a little bit on drivers, a little bit on training and various things. Um, but it's quite, you know, it's it's quite diverse. I haven't listed it basically everyone, basically, there, but the, um, um, some of the, the main characters that have been highly involved in the project are basically listed there. Um, myself, I chair sort of the Ian McLeod from MTIA, so that was the typo. Um, uh, Drew's been um, project managing it, and um, uh, Olivia, various of the um, UARC team have basically helped out, and David and Sally Wilson have basically been pulling a lot of stuff to, um, together. Um, we in this idea of construction sort of logistics, there was basically a pretty much a, a global search went on because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but in some cases, we probably we probably are because we'll diverge a little bit from the UK standard, which um, um, you know, has already been mentioned um, that it's unique in some ways. And um, but out of the I think it was 120 um, plus, um, so I suppose hits that we got on. Um, uh, um, logistics, uh, construction sort of logistics, there was about two dozen that were actually quite vitally important basically to this project. Um, these will be packaged up and um, and circulated because I think a lot of the reading is actually very useful for people actually in the industry and, um, uh, and Europe has done sort of quite a bit in this area. Even some of the city logistics stuff um, has been involved in the area. And, um, and so, um, you yeah, know, that started us on our way. Um, with Basically, had a working group. The working groups met pretty much about every um, fortnight or so, and um, just to sort of kind of kick things along. So, um, so where we are is where we are at the moment, which I'll go through. Um, next slide, thanks, Jerome. Um, yeah, um, we yeah we spoke to the UK. Um, we looked at uh, various um, European bits and bobs, and uh, there was some very interesting cases in the um, the run up to the London Olympics where. Uh, new logistics parks were actually sort of put in place where it could actually be as not as consolidation centres um, instead of having thousands of trucks running sort of there and sort of back and whatever they were, but they were going to a particular centre. Stuff was being, uh, you know, 
different elements of different stadia were being um, um, yeah, constructed, and so it, it really cut down the number of movements and the number of kilometres within the city. Um, uh, do, do, do. Um, and as Michael has already said, that you know the um, some of the the, 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 the truck related stuff, and also Chris has, has mentioned that there were um, you know various elements actually for they were background basically for us to build on, um, which is really because creating the Australian um, construction logistics plan itself. And so we were a bit different and we're a bit a bit the same. Next slide, Joe. Um, yeah, so the overall thing is we actually want to actually um, create this uh, construction sort of logistics plan. And there, there's elements to it um, that literally, as I said, that they, they do overlap somewhat with the two previous groups, but overall they sit at a, at a somewhat sort of higher level. So the, the elements that within the um, uh, construction logistics, um, it, when you're putting your construction logistics plan together, there's obviously the traffic management plan, the route planning, um, the particular access approvals that you actually sort of have to get. Um, but there's also um, efficiencies and um, productivity. Often you hear the term with uh, property that it's all about location, location, location. With logistics, um, probably according to me, it's um, planning, planning and planning because really nothing should happen without it sort of actually being planned. And that's true for a large construction project as well. So um, there's various elements that actually lead to that um, um, the full out of the planning process that involve um, operational benefits and, um, and productivity achievements. Next um, slide, Jerome. Um, do, do, do. There were, besides the um, uh, very large uh, literature reviews, um, which were also helped out by um, um, sort of MTIA and, and MUARC, so you know, we give them credit there that um, there were <coughs> 17 quite in-depth interviews and they're basically being written up sort of as well. So this really brought the flavour back to Australianising it, I suppose, as opposed to actually having it sort of as a, um, a mirror image of um, Clocks UK. So we really sort of more or less commence the Australian flavour basically into the standard. Next one, Joe. Um, yeah, so a large number of um, um, articles were actually produced. Um, and they were really synthesised down to, I think it turned out to be about, certainly 2000, I think it was 26 was the magic number of various um, key areas that we could really sort of pick up and run with basically in Australia. Next one, Jerome. Uh, as I said before, that the, we're still, we're, we're still highly involved and we're not getting away in any shape or form for the, um, the safety aspect of the um, vulnerable road users. And really that kicked off the whole show, started the ball rolling in the UK with, um, you know, Clocks UK was really on the focus of the, um, uh, you know, the vulnerable road users when you had very, very large construction projects basically happening, especially at the time of um, the, um, the, the London Olympics, um, but also sort of large projects as well. Um, yeah, you, this this whole problem gets revisited basically sort of all the time, and realistically, um, yeah, that focus is never going away. But it, it it does impact on your your whole planning cycle, which is basically your route planning, sort of your getting your access approvals and your da day to day operations. Um, so um, yeah, and and also from a standards point of view, um, a standard is very are specific, especially if you're doing things like desktop audits, you've really got to have the, the documentation, um, the planning documents, the operational documents, basically, and um, as so that the, the auditor, um, whoever he or she may be, can actually come and really sort of tick off what you've actually said you've done. Next one, Jerome. Um, uh, first of all, um, you know, back to basics, um, someone's got to be responsible for this in the company. You know? So it's all right to say, oh yeah, we want to be, um, you know, Clocks A sort of certified. Um, you know, um, well, who's it? <laughs> is it? Is it a small team? Is it a group of um, uh, part-time officers? Is um, someone and one only person uh, really given the job basically to, to look after, after the um, and put all the goods and bobs together so that in order to come along and stay here, they're actually certified against the Clocks A standard. 
Um, if a standard is actually put in place, um, all, as many of you may well know if you've been through the, the QA processes, especially that um, uh, certification for a particular sort of industry um, feature or operation really has to have the approval of um, senior management. They've got to buy into this. In some cases, they actually champion it, um, uh, but not always. And so often there'll be a general manager and he will appoint somebody to actually be the, the custodian of the logistics plan, of the um, construction logistics plan. And so that, that person deals with the, um, uh, the auditors, they deal with possibly consultants who actually um, are any of the experts in their own field, where it actually overlaps with the particular elements of the construction logistics plan. And so, yeah, it's, it's very important because that person becomes the central repository. And even though they themselves may deal with several other people, basically in the company, um, that are, you know, one will be, uh, they, will, they will talk to the, um, the, um, the HR people, they'll talk to the people who actually monitor and sort of um, schedule the drivers. They'll talk to the people that also, um, you know, the entity that and the subcontractors that actually run it. And if you've got your own fleet, then you'll be talking probably to your own maintenance people and schedulers as well. So they actually become the, the center of the octopus, basically for the clock standard. And um, um, and being, being that they are the central repository basically for the auditor as well. And again, all those elements um, basically blend together to really still bring out this idea of um, um, controlled operations and um, to which um, the, the, the safety, I suppose, the safety focus basically bounces out of. Next one, Jerome. Um, what, um, what happens basically is when a contract is actually let, um, someone in the organisation and eventually the person who will actually be the, the holder of the construction logistics plan, you've actually got to know the capacity and the, the, the size of the operation that you're actually entering into. Um, because you want to know like how many trips a day, what, what, what's the, the breakdown of the particular fleets that will actually be delivering um, uh, this particular um, um, operation to actually get this project sort of finished. So a knowledge of the, the operation and it's how big, how long is a piece of string, like what's the size basically of it? Because you've got to know, you know the capacity and the capacity will depend on the time of the project, obviously the... Um, um, yeah, the, the, all the all the approvals that you actually need, um, and this goes for you know sort of local government, state government, and don't know about federal, but you know if it's a partly funded sort of state and federal sort of project, then sort of you know um, may, may well sort of implement sort of various uh, approvals at the three levels of government. Um, but you you have to actually you know, know that um, there may well be different routes. Basically, we, we've mentioned the vehicle types, and some people often think that, oh, yes, just truck and dogs running around. But you've got your cranes, you've got your concrete agitators. Uh, when you get into your low loaders and overdimensional stuff, then you might have to actually pick another route. Um, yeah, even semi trailers, basically, a lot of um, scaffolding is delivered to buildings, basically, in semi trailers. And um, but you know what sort of fleet you actually use and how how many operations a day they will actually have, you know, will some of them only be restricted to time of day and things like this. So there's an enormous amount of, um, I suppose, upkeep on the operational side that basically also buys into the planning. The route planning is especially important because of the, um, uh, the, the high density urban, urban projects uh, where you actually have a lot of, um, you know, um, greater hazards by different times of day and things like that. Uh, next one, Jerome. Um, the, the drivers themselves, and Michael's just basically touched on this, and um, there will be some comments basically in the new um, National Heavy Vehicle sort of framework basically concerning um, vulnerable road users because they are so um, so much in the focus of um, you know, local, state, and uh, federal governments with regard to. Um, um, yeah, sort of um, fatalities basically and um, and the fatalities basically for a vulnerable road user I hate to say this but um, I get involved with um, one of the research institutes that look 
ships that may do crashes and whatever, but um, they're on a, a dollar per crash basis now, to a certain extent, as much as it's you know horrible to say that you know sort of a um, truck and dog running over a, a bicycle may not necessarily sort of cause a lot of damage to the truck and to the insurer. Um, so it may not be counted, but it is actually a very important sort of um, incident because there has actually been a fatality. So, um, um, you know, so the the whole of the, uh, I suppose, the route planning side um, is highly important because of the um, uh, potential, especially by time of day with schools, shopping centres, um, you know, um, Footy grounds on Saturdays and Sundays and things like this. Um, you know, a lot of projects do run 24/7, and um, so the uh, hazards are basically um, there. And so again, this uh, whole um, replanning side of things and time of day very, very much feeds into the construction logistics plan. And um, uh, you know, that's never going to go away. So you really need the drivers themselves, as Michael has said, uh, to really look at a particular. Um, I wouldn't go as far as everyone needs to do a particular course on vulnerable road users, but they need a, an awareness so that they actually become far more vigilant, basically, to the um, uh, the frequency of potential hazards, basically, going to and from a, a large sort of urban project. And um, we've got them in Sydney, we've got them in Melbourne, we've got them in Brisbane, you know. So, um, uh, you know, that, um, that awareness and that vigilance um, should never actually be allowed to lapse. Also, I mentioned the last bit, but from a logistics point of view, um, productivity is very important from one supplier to another. Um, you know, if someone's far more productive than the other, so then basically, um, yeah, chances are they're going to do the job cheaper. Um, they'll be looked at um, as far as their uh, capacity to deliver against the job, but also sort of, you know, what productivity measures they can bring um, versus, you know, tend to B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, next one, Jerome. Um, yeah, I'd mentioned productivity. How we actually sort of buy this into the um, gold, silver, and bronze, and I'll, I'll admit up front, um, I had a bit of a think about sort of gold, sort of silver, and bronze. Um, Sage, the the more you document, the more you have knowledge basically of your operation. Um, the more you put into your your route planning, the more you can identify hazards. The more that you actually do. Um, and obviously connecting with the um, truck side of it and the, the driver side of it, then you know you you know you're liable to sort of you know, be the in, in the bronze, silver, and sort of gold area. Um, now, with regard to productivity, um, yeah, you should companies should get a tick for productivity. There's no worries about that. It's um, you know delivering to site um, if you can actually ever triangulate between two particular construction sites, um, some big. Um, Operators can. Um, in fact, some um, concrete agitator work, you know, may go from one concrete plant to another concrete plant before they actually think so. Not just necessarily oscillates between um, one plant and a and a particular site. Um, you know, not that we use um, barges basically in um, in Australia, but um, uh, in Europe, it's it's not uncommon. Basically, especially Holland, um, you know, and even in um, France, I was at um, a concrete uh, plant that part of it delivered rubble from particular construction sites, basically in Paris, and it sort of took it to the, uh, I suppose the um, the concrete manufacturing centre, and, um, and part of that was loaded stuff came into the in inputs to the concrete manufacturing centre came in on a barge, and the barge actually took out rubble from um, a particular uh, construction sites around Paris, and basically this saved. Lots and lots of partial trips, basically thousands of partial trips, you know, literally every month. So that was, um, and we, we don't have, um, even though there's probably a bit of water in the Murray at the moment, I don't have any um, major projects that are sort of basically you know, going up there. There might be a few after the water goes down, but anyhow, um, as I said, the, so the, there's, there's productivity issues. Obviously, that um, the use of high productivity vehicles is good. Um, there's more. Than just the um, the truck of dogs. I think we've actually seen. I don't think they call them high productivity dogs, but we're now seeing um, things like twin steer, triple sort of axles, basically on concrete agitators. Once upon a time, I remember that said um, you know uh, literally you know three axles on a concrete agitator. Now you now you got up to five. And so um, 
how you get brownie points basically for doing that really depends on um, um, your um, kilometre savings. Um, now, why um, kilometre savings are actually good, well, especially kilometre savings in a heavy concentrated um, urban area, because that's that's where you, predominantly where your hazards are, and um, and insurance insurance data has actually shown that um, literally. The more kilometres you do, basically, the, the greater risk you actually have out on the road. And uh, as you can imagine, that if you run a million clicks a year, um, your insurance premium is going to be higher than if you run sort of 10,000 clicks a year. And the insurers are well and truly aware of this. And um, and similarly, and it's probably even more pertinent for the construction industry because there is so much work basically happening sort of in, in town, and which means your, your cyclists, your motorcyclists, your school kids, um, your um, shopping mall customers and things like this. You know, it's just um, you know, by time of day, um, you know, there, there's, there's far greater um, greater challenges. Anyhow, um, um, so how we actually uh, give brownie points basically for the um, productivity side of it um, is um, something we will actually sort of take on board. We haven't sort of finalised, as I said, the gold, silver and bronze yet, but it's to do with um, um, you know, really having a handle on what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you report on it will actually be very sort of um, um, pertinent basically to the gold, silver and bronze standard. Next one, Jerome. Um, at the end of the day, what's an order to want? An order to basically want some documentation. They want to be able to sort of tick off um, what you say you're going to do, what you do and prove that you've done it. That's um, as one of my QA managers used to say, you know, um, it's a simple task. Well, it should be a simple task. There's a rule saying that realistically, you should be able to actually prove what you do from your day to day documents. You shouldn't have to create sort of a whole brand new suite of documents because that's the way the auditor wants. Get another auditor. Um, basically, you should be able to create sort of what you've done out of your day to day worksheets and compile them and basically yeah, possibly um, spreadsheet some of the, the totals that are actually involved. And certainly um, um, that's, you know, um, yeah, th that makes life far easier and often far cheaper when it actually comes to the sort of doing the, doing the audits. And the, real, the thing is that if you've got a good handle on your operation and your productivity and your documentation with regard to your, um, your, your access approvals especially, um, you know, then you, you're really in a good state for um, basically getting a big tick at the TG3 level. And, um, you know, and I said, what makes life good for the, the auditors will actually sort of help you, um, you know, possibly achieve your gold, silver and bronze standards. Next one, Jerome. So you got any questions? Now? Questions now, Kim. So yeah, that's it. So, very thank much you for that. Very much an overview. And um, yeah, any queries? Um, and just to let you all know, we we do actually have um, so all this is translated. We'll be going out into the into the Word document, uh, the standard that will be circulated with everyone, so you can see the translation of this into a into the single standard. So Rachel makes an interesting point here. Well, I think productivity is a different focus than safety, and I'm wondering whether there should be uh, there should be a key focus of Clocksafe, particularly since we are working with a broad range of vehicles in the construction fleet. What's your thoughts, Kim? You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, is, that, is that back online now? You're online now. Yeah, yeah. No, no, productivity and um, and, and safety are actually bedfellows. Um, the, the three studies done so far on high productivity vehicles, just as an example, the kilometre savings basically save fatalities. They are related. That, um, as I said before, if you do a million clicks as opposed to 10,000, um, you know, if you can do your task in, if you take something like a BAB quad, a BAB quad saves 42% of the kilometres that you would do with two VWs. Now, there, there, is a, there is a safety benefit basically in that. The, the, the two are inextricably linked. Um, it, it, to, you know, they're two different words. Um, but there are absolute savings basically because of productivity. It's not, at the end of the day, 
everything that I've mentioned um, has an underlying safety focus about it. And so, and, and productivity is part of that basket, as with the access approvals, um, basically, and the route planning itself, because um, the, two, the particular tools you use for route planning, if you can actually bypass high hazard areas, great. Um, if you can use great software with um, you know, um, digital mapping um, to get around sort of particular problems. And as I said, you will also need um, route planning for the different types of um, vehicles, from your low loaders to your awesome. concrete agitators might have different routes. So bottom line, Rachel, yes, there is a very, very strong link between productivity and safety. Um, so, and just for a clarification as well on that, like it's not mean we're pushing organisations down that, it's probably exploring it and highlighting it as an opportunity where if organisations were doing a planning to do it, um, they can actually use it for their systems. It's not saying, and and on the barging one, just to mention, Sydney Metro used barging for some of their components on supplying their project. And I think it's one thing is, is back to the very beginning, if you can eliminate the risk by taking it off the road, there's, there's a great example of how you can do it from the very beginning on that as well. So any other questions? Or if not, we'll be looking at taking a break in a moment. Just a quick... Um, it, just on the last one there, Jeremy, um, was um, we're not suggesting people race out and buy a new fleet. In fact, um, most high productivity vehicle fleets, basically, they don't go out and replace the fleet tomorrow. It's done incrementally that um, in most cases, the average turned out to be, even if you had a fleet of 200 vehicles, that most people put their toe in the water and probably have, a, have about five sort of um, um, PBS vehicles, for instance. And with the construction industry, we have seen um, the enormous emergence of three axle truck and dogs go to four axle truck and dogs um, with then limited five axle truck and dogs and even fewer six axle truck and dogs, but they're all developing productivity and they haven't gone out necessarily and replaced the whole fleet at once. Well, thanks, Kim. One last question here from Bill. Can you please detail how much industry engagement involvement has occurred to this stage? Um, Goes back to your interviews, wouldn't it? Yeah, the, the 17 interviews basically um, that David's been undertaking, and um, they're being summarised with the um, uh, the uh, literature review, and then the, I suppose the, the core literature review. So we haven't put names to faces; we didn't want to incriminate anyone. Um, but um, every every one of those interviews, David said he's learned something actually new, and there was a gold mine basically there at the end of the end of the rainbow. So um, they were quite. Um, uh, you know, absolutely, absolutely useful. So this was anything but a theoretical exercise. Awesome. Thank you very much, for Kim. Great job by your group. Um, what we're going to do now, everyone, is just take a quick uh, seven-minute break just so everyone can go top of their coffee, visit the toilet, whatever they need to do, and we will circle back in um, for the last half to close out uh, through, through to the National Workshop. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you back at... 11.40, thank you.
morning, everyone. I hope you are able to use the break and um, we're all back and ready to go. So uh, I guess, Michael, are you there? Are you happy to kick off? He's, uh, he's just stepped out of the room, Jerome. He should be back in a minute or so. Oh, awesome. Thanks for that, Luke. I'll just wait for a moment until Michael's back and kick it all off in, in a moment. Just being mindful of time, I'll get things up and going now, and we are still recording, um, so we'll be able to share this all afterwards. And just to reiterate, we will be sharing the PowerPoint, um, it will be a link to the recording, and we will also uh, be providing the draft standard following this uh, this this workshop. So thank you all very much for your active contribution. So um, my name's, actually, if you haven't realised, my name is Jerome Carslake. I chair the uh, the technical group four plus the uh, overall steering group of the program. And I have the pleasure of doing it with Martin Toomey of um, Arts RI and with the pleasure of uh, Ruby Athanos from Swinburne, who's, who's the support for this group now as well. So um, just moving forward, huge acknowledgements for this group. We have re met regularly every sort of uh, once a month going through steadily moving all the components forward. You can see the broad range of inputs and we've had a pretty strong core group moving it along so thank you very much to those who have, who have been contributing all the way through and you can see the diversity of the groups um you'll probably see melissa weller there and you realize now she's at healthy heads she actually kicked it off to start with um, and then decide uh, she was the, the the initial chair um, and then it was passed on to me to take on the role from there so thank you all to everyone who's con contributed through the life of this sort of this project um of technical group four so the purpose of of um the communications advocacy advocacy group was the stream one was really looking at the community engagement so awareness beyond just the major projects so that's the outreach to um, the community to the vulnerable road users making helping get them aware of um, of safe interactions with the heavy vehicles um, and then stream two was the advocacy from the point of making um, the business case for clock safe for major projects and other sort of groups and um, small ones as well around to why they should be involved within um, the clock safe program and how it all goes forward so what you can see here is the development process um, that we've undertaken, which is really mapping the stakeholders, understanding and defining the problem, the issue, looking at all the different sort of content and material which is out there and then sort of drawing on that. Because one of the key things which we've seen throughout, um, I guess, all the other sort of streams were not set on the purpose of, um, I guess, creating from scratch, but building on what already exists. And there's enormous amounts of work that's been done. Um, and we always want to point to and draw on those elements. Um, a lot of consultations sort of taken place um, from the supporting partners and steering group. <coughs> and then we've been sort of going through into developing the content and you'll see that as we go through the components. And the last sort of part is, is obviously goes towards implementation. And then how do we monitor and evaluate the impact over time of outreach? So what you sort of see here is really sort of one of the key sums of fundamentals as an example of learnings, which underpins the CLOCKS program over in the UK and that's really just understanding which organizations have the greatest influence um, to impact to work through the uh, I guess the people in the supply chain and the projects um, along the way and, and how they can sort of do it so obviously regulators have the power of enforcement those sort of components which flow through the clients the principal and the fleet operators um, and then at the very end, and then you have sort of community that sits around the side as well. And that's probably the, the, the lower level of influence. But then where we need greater levels of information flowing through to reduce the risk um, is we then sort of flow through the other sort of way where the focus on is by communicating to, to the community, fleet operators, principal contractors and along the lines, and um, we can get people aware of how to reduce the risk and interactions with uh, major trucks and the projects as well in that sort of sense. So to do this um, in mapping the stakeholders, mm -hmm. And it was great when I was chatting to, to Martin, they followed a very similar process um, when Arts I was coming along as, as to the power of influence um, and how you can sort of move groups along. So uh, Rowan Gerard uh, was the initial person who did a lot of work around this and he did the consultation, identified the stakeholder groups, reached out, interviewed, had discussions um, and did a breakdown into a segments to where all the different sort of groups sit, what sort of influence um, they have and how that can go through. And, and we actually have a nice report that will be sitting on the website. As, as you'll see, all material will be 
shared from the technical groups that helps underpin the work that's been taking it all forward. But you can sort of see how it's sort of broken down into the various sort of cohorts um, along the sort of grouping and then what the sort of comms and engagement represents with those sort of areas. And one thing I will say straight up, it's, it, we've had some fantastic support from the major projects and industry in particular um, around what is good practice communications and what can we sort of draw on that can feed it, feed into the program, which you can sort of adapt and draw on as well. Um, and one of the one of the powers of this clock say program is it's is is it's moving across the states and the jurisdictions and drawing them all together because some of the content that we've been able to draw on uh, industry and other sort of uh, states have highlighted and said that that's just fantastic. Why haven't we got that locally? And that's what this will sort of allow us to draw through to provide that consistent messaging up and down and to do the different sort of groups that we're all sort of talking to the same, same sort of line. There's not duplication or, or crossover or mixed messaging, and it's all going to be evidence based and going through. So the key thing is, is when we've mapped out these groups out, um, the key players is understanding in this sort of group here and, and identifying that sort of group as the ones we really need to keep engaged. They have the power and the interest that we need to keep aligned with communications. Um, these ones were to keep informed and they have sort of low power, but the high interest in what's sort of going on. And they could sort of be the ones that can be quite impacted around the co cult, around sort of product lines or, or sort of logistics groups sitting on the periphery and those sort of things. And if you can keep them sort of um, satisfied as well. And then the ones that sing in this sort of tier, sort of sit off to the side, but we just sort of keep them in go engaged as we sort of move along. Um, and then as we're sort of looking at the process, um, they were sort of broken down and Ron went through and mapped these sort of out as to where the different stakeholders sit um, and where they're sort of sitting in those sort of areas. And that sort of really helped underpin um, when we sort of designed and pulled the components together. And it's sort of been fed back and presented to the technical group um, as we've met and moved them along on the journey in between each of the sort of sessions. So jumping straight in, what we decided is probably the easiest way to present the standard from um, regards to communication is mapping it out into, um, I guess, a table like this, which will sit in the back of the standard as an appendix. Um, what we've tried to do is draw on where this sort of sits. And once again, you can see the responsible stakeholders that sits there and you reflect back to their position of influence and how we need to move them along in those sort of areas. Um, and now they're sort of been broken down in sort of areas. And once again, we've aligned with, um, I guess, this is sort of sitting around the bronze uh, and this is then sitting around the silver gold where we sort of lump them together in those sort of areas. Uh, and then what we've sort of gone through is, is broken them down by the influences as well, which you can see, see across the side here. The key thing is, is the item line um, that sits along these components on, on this sort of element here. And then we have the tools and deliverables that allows that item to be met. Um, and all those sort of components we picked up and translated and made available through the uh, the Clocksay website. We fed into it also on the first sort of one. Um, it's really just looking at contract clauses, having that sort of built into the component, and that once again applies just to all contract or Clocksay sites. Um, Clocksay members, so those are the organisations that sign up and become it. That's just providing the clear principles as to where you sit. Um, and just recognising your membership lo logo, your role as acting as a champion and what those requirements are. Next stage, we begin moving into what will be required um, to the different sort of sectors and where that sort of sits across um, from like this. For example, the first one um, is, the, is the membership sort of insignia. Um, and when we say sort of all site entrances, we reflected once again and drawn on the approach over in the UK. Um, and that'd be like a clock say branding, depending what that, that site will be. And that, that could be just a simple sort of poster as per what's taken place over in the UK with their approach. And, the group decided uh, as, as going through is we wanted to try and mirror as much as possible as to how things have been approached over in the UK because quite a, some of the larger companies are international organisations. Um, they they have operations over there and it's a lot easier case to make the same case if that's business as usual and working on the projects over there. It makes life a lot easier for replicating into Australia as well. Um, and that's where we found quite a lot of synergies in that sort of, that sort of approach. Um, contractor safe branding. That would then align with what's in the brand um, guidance, um, and that's all sort of being developed up at the moment. And basically, it would just go up on there. One of the key things with everything, um, and you'll see this in the clock say standard, is is making sure that there is um, a primary contact detail. Um, and what we mean by that is yes, yes, that's what's going to be required. It's just a simple document that that's going to be be rem and remain current. So when things sort of pop through the clock say program, can find that person, they can track it and anything can flow through very easy. And that's sort of going to be sitting right the way through the clock say standard because if someone's name is next to something and accountable, um, it's a lot easier to track and make sure something's been put in place. And that's an easy sort of measure as it goes forward. 
Um, this is where we begin talking around uh, the, the clock say community engagement process. And this is just saying this is the methodology we need to do um, from before the project happens, how it's going to go through the life, and then saying it very, very clear as to what that's going to look like. And once again, that will depend on the size and the scale and, 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 and where the sort of project is. And that's really start of life. And that's quite sort of consistent in that sort of level. Um, the next sort of one we're going through after that, community engagement along logistics routes and, and local community. So that's like an activation in those sort of area. Um, it could be all sorts of uh, components in there, but they'll be sort of guided as to what that packages can look like. Um, and then as an example, would be the, the then sort of saying, well, we need some ca case studies of, of what's worked as well. Because one, one of the big things in the clocks and the program over there, the fleet operator recognition scheme that underpins clocks is a lot of case studies going in because as soon as we begin producing them, it can really map out the how and the why and the what that organisations can do, and they'll be quite short and sharp as we move as we go along. Once again, you can sort of see how they're responsible to the primary contractors, but they'll then be sort of look at engaging the community in relation to their sort of projects. And look, and that's really just business as usual. Is a lot of the major projects are already doing this, um, and we're not trying to say suck eggs. It's, it's like drawing them in and saying, well, this is what they've got in place and how we can sort of point that out. So some of the smaller ones can sort of draw on those learnings as they go through. Um, the next one that we're sort of looking at uh, going along. Jeez, I'm flying. Um, so these are the other sort of currents. I won't go through them all in detail. We will be mapping them out as we move forward, as I'm just getting prompt I got it to close out. Um, Key thing, as you can see here, is the, is the case studies and uh, template, as you mentioned. And we're sort of just saying, look, one per project, three per project. And that mirrors what's been taking place in the New Sydney Metro project. Um, and then there's got to be a way of actually monitoring community complaints over time as well and sort of recording where that's happening. Because one of the big successes of clocks over in the UK was when it was put in place, there was a big downturn in complaints to local government and other sort of areas as well. Um, this is then going into the branding of the vehicles. Um, what we're looking at for the insignias and those sort of areas, it sort of aligns with NHVS stickers. We don't want to be sitting, sitting and blocking it up. It can make it very, very clear as to what a Clocks, Clocks A branded truck is. Um, and then there'll be like other examples where it can go through and branding, cyclists aware, exactly like pointed out where that sticker should sit. Um, and also then looking at some vehicle activation programs, which can be linked into community engagements. And you'll just see them coming up and tick. Um, for supporting outputs, these are a number of sort of things which are un under development at the moment. I've touched on case studies. You can see a whole number of these which are being developed at the moment. This is just some of the ones which are working through and then be a single back front page mapping it all out. Um, this is the ride along sort of approach which has been developed since undergoing ethics approval and it's a collaboration between Monash and Swinburne University. Um, and the key goal for that is actually providing the opportunity for policymakers, influencers, other ones groups uh, to jump in a truck, spend a few hours in the truck, seeing through the eyes of a truck driver, recording via video the before and the after as well. So you can measure their pre how that what their thoughts are. Because it's one thing to sit in a truck, but there's another whole different experience to ride along in a truck and seeing how other people interact with it. And we can document it, put it all through. And that can, it can use that for branding to sort of, and messaging to show these that, that are going through. Um, toolbox talks, big thing out to uh, Victorian DOT and Rachel Carlisle, um, they're developing three at the moment with Swinburne University and Monash around adapting the, the heavy vehicle toolbox talk methodology, which NHV is doing, and we're looking at doing another two around urban driving and vision perceptions. These will then be created um, and they'll be publicly available. And the other part then is just making sure that all the branding, everything is in place. Um, so we can make sure that everything is nice and easy when you, when you go through it and can find it all. So um, I've covered a lot in that brief moment, so I'm open to questions, please. Thanks, Jerome. Um, so I'll just go through the chat. Um, just to remind everyone, if you could, if you have any questions, please send them through in the chat, or um, if you um, want to put your hand up as well, you can do that. Um, we do have a question that's come through from Bradley Glennon. Um, so Bradley said, um, will benefits or concessions apply to those companies that participate and reach each particular standard? Um, I'm not sure if you have an answer to that one, Jerome, or yeah, if that's I'd say one. That I think it's like a broader question to the whole sort of program and interacting yeah. with, with it all. And it comes down, to, I guess, to the risk approach of where we land with each sort of site and the standard and how that's sort of applied. So the benefit would be is you'll get they'll they'll reliably get access to um, the site and the program and they can do they can meet that requirement and it gives peace of mind that if you're doing that, you're meeting all the regulatory and legal requirements as well. 
um, and you also get a promotional uh, benefit. So some sites may go up to the to the silver, for example. But the big thing is 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 the reliability of um, for industry uh, for the the tier one projects, any sort of projects, I should say that they're, they're everything's legally compliant, and also confidence to the transport mums, even small operators that they can if they meet those sort of standards, they'll know there's going to be the business that sits into those sort of stuff, and they can't get undercut by others as well, and that's. Um, the safe load mm -hmm. program and the um, Cox program in the UK have all demonstrated that exact same thing. Once they sort of meet that, um, they can go through and you've got reliability. And the last thing I'll just say is the goal is is with the gold, silver, bronze to the exact point when you think about Merv, is there's that continuous improvement. So once again, if you make the investment up in those sort of other trucks over time, they will probably they will sort of shift down, um, and that's going to be guided by the steering, um, the board of, and the industry group that governs um, clock mm -hmm. moving forward. Great, thanks, Jerome. Um, no other questions in the chat, so cool. And I, and I will just say, look, I've been very lucky and fortuitous with uh, such a great group um, of and very diverse as well, um, and I think that's what's helped with the richness of bringing it in. Uh, and everything has been very consultative. I think there's been sort of seven or eight different iterations of the um, the clocks and the communications advocacy standards. So thank you all very much for your support. I'll move on. I believe I'm now passing across to you, uh, Michael, for your part. All oh, right. Okay. Great. Um, so. Might, uh, yeah, so um, this section, um, we're basically um, going to present um, just a bit of um, the considerations that have gone into um, basically the audit and accreditation side of, of the standards. So Clocks A um, will uh, be a standard. Um, uh, so obviously as part of that standard, um, there's an important part in terms of uh, verifying that the organisation signing up to that standard is actually implementing it. So. Um, this is uh, a very important part of um, of the Clocks A project itself, um, which we are yeah starting work on um, at this stage in in parallel with the drafting of the standard requirements. So might go to the next slide. Thanks, Jerome. Just to see what. Uh... Right, great, cool. So yeah, so I'll just um, uh, go through some of the considerations which um, uh, have been uh, put into in into writing the um, overarching audit framework. Um, and this is um, really uh, in the development stage at this at this stage, and will obviously be um, at, at a later time as well. Will be um, uh, uh, consulted on too. So, the uh, as I mentioned before, conformance to the Clock A standard needs to be verified. So um, there needs to be uh, basically a I guess to cl to close the loop, um, there needs to be a check that the Clock A um, standard is actually being implemented by organisations who sign up to it. Um, we've done. A number of um, a lot of the other presenters today have have um, uh, mentioned that there's there's been a number of um, discussions that we've had with the parent clocks um, UK program, um, as well as the fleet operator recognition scheme, which sits underneath um, clocks in the UK um, as the minimum requirement for um, the uh, vehicle um, operator um, side of things. In addition to that, we have consulted with um, similar local programs and schemes. Um, in Australia, such as the uh, Jerome mentioned, the safe loading program, as well as the former um, ALC's logistic safety um, uh, code as well. Um, and just uh, basically looking at those different models, how they go about um, governing and ensuring that um, those standards or codes are being applied by the organisation signing up to them. Um, so uh, yeah, we understand um, with this standard, um, it's not just one particular um, stakeholder or, or industry um, party. There are a lot of different stakeholders involved in the construction of of a of a you know infrastructure or, or building, um, and we will be looking to define them very similar to um, the way it is laid out in the UK's um, version of of the standard, which is um, defining um, four core stakeholders um, who. Um, have uh, uh, requirements to implement the standard, um, and those will include planning authorities, um, uh, clients um, or developers, principal contractors, and transport operators. Um, so they will have responsibilities under the standard, um, a lot of which the technical groups have, have discussed in their presentations to date um, will be translated into um, those responsibilities. 
So um, because of those different stakeholder um, stakeholders um, uh, responsibilities as part of the standard, that will influence the audit type uh, as well as the auditor's level of um, experience and competency required. Um, for the audits themselves, we will be proposing um, that this will consist of a desktop review um, of documentation and records to show that um, that performance standard has been met um, or that specification has been met. Um, and then that will be followed by um, a form of physical sampling to verify that implementation. Um, as an example, in the UK's um, clocks uh, model, they do require a minimum of 20% um, of the organization's operational sites and vehicles to be um, physically sampled um, uh, as part of um, their requirements. So the proposal um, for um, the accreditation um, following the audit is that that, that would be issued um, following passing of the audit um, and um, again aligning with the UK clocks model um, we are pr proposing um, an option for self-assessment in the following year if there are zero findings um, from that accreditation audit um, or opportunities for improvement. Um, then follow the follow-up audit frequency will have to reflect the nature and level of findings um, and auditors um, themselves will need to be independent to the organization being audited um, and the proposal is that the clocks a managing body would appoint those auditors um, so if you go to the next slide thanks jerome um, and this is a bit of a, a draft uh flow chart um, which uh yeah the steering group has um, prepared um just to um, show what that would look like. Um, so, and this will obviously be um, worked on and, and circulated for um, consultation as well with the Clocks A community. Um, but essentially, um, the process for signing up to Clocks A um, is proposed that this would be through um, uh, completing an application to the Clocks A uh, managing body, who would then issue a self assessment. Um, uh, checklist um, for that organization to complete um, within that first month. Um, that would be issued to the Clocks A managing body who would then appoint an auditor who would um, uh, review that self-assessment and then um, set up an uh, initial accreditation audit um, within the first three months. Um, then depending, as I previously mentioned um, on, on the previous slide, um, depending on the uh, findings um, from that audit, um, that would determine whether um, a corrective action plan would be issued um, or um, the uh, organization would then uh, move down towards the uh, self-assessment route um, following the um, first accreditation audit. So um, that organization would be uh, given accreditation in that green box um, following that. And then every other year, um, they would have to go through again another accreditation audit. Um, so basically you um, to maintain accreditation, you would want to be um, within the green box um, and within that loop. Um, so obviously um, uh, above the corrective action plan um, process would require a follow up audit um, and the time frame would be dependent on the level of the um, findings um, issued. Um, and we're proposing that that must be within uh, three months time and then um, should the organization close out those actions, they would then move down into the accreditation um, green box. Um, where organizations um, uh, would fail to close out um, any uh, corrective actions identified, um, they would then be asked to um, show cause. Um, and uh, again, that would be reviewed by um, the Clocks A audit panel um, and then asked to uh, follow up um, on those actions and close them out with an agreed time frame um, before again regaining that accreditation. If not, um, there is that ultimate um, accreditation re uh, rejected um, box at the end. So if the organization um, uh, failed to close out corrective actions after a repeated time. So um, that's what we're proposing at a high level. Um, there's obviously a lot more detail behind that um, and the supporting processes underneath each of those stages, um, which will be worked through um, with our members um, in the audit working group. So um, next slide. Thanks, Jerome. Um, so this is uh, basically what I've just spoke about, um, just summarized in in, uh, uh, in in this slide. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, the self-assessment um, would be conducted within the first month. 
conformance to the um, standard would be verified by an independent auditor within that three months. Um, yeah, I just mentioned um, basically all those points in that flow chart. So um, I think the last thing, just in regards to the auditors as well, um, considerations as well, um, there will be a pre-qualification process which will be established um, for auditors approved for Clocks A auditing. The auditors um, would be qualified um, to a lead auditor for safety management systems with a transport and logistics um, and construction um, experience um, or both, and they would be allocated to um, that particular audit um, uh, when required. Um, and they would auditors would be assigned by the Clocks A managing body and endorsed by the steering group as well as that their experience and competency requirements um, will have to be commensurate to the level of audit complexity required to undertake against the Clocks A standard. Um, so that's um, basically, um, sorry, next step. So um, yeah, obviously um, this is sort of um, happening in parallel with the standard now. So we're sort of about six months behind the standard development, um, but we'll be looking at um, yeah, drafting this framework and process um, uh, by the audit working group. Um, in, in the next uh, few months, um, having that ready for uh, March next year, uh, the audit and accreditation. So that will result in basically an audit and accreditation business rules and standards document, um, which will need to be uh, completed by May um, next year. Um, in addition to that, um, with the actual standard um, being drafted, a self-assessment and audit tool will be developed as well by the tool. Um, so that's, I think that's it. Yeah, so. Uh, happy to take questions. I think we've got a few in the chat. Yeah, we we do indeed. So I knew <laughs> you'd get some good ones in. So um, cool. first one we've got is from Thomas. How are the inherent risks of the participant activities and business model taken into consideration when auditing an infield assurance? E.g. a 100% direct owned fleet would have a different risk profile to a subcontractor or non-driver affiliated arrangements. Like it's, it's one of those yeah. fundamental yeah. questions that pops up every time. Yeah, definitely. So um, it's a good question, um, Thomas, and um, uh, the answer to that question um, hasn't been, um, uh, has, we haven't uh, got an answer to that question at this stage, but um, it will have to be considered. Obviously, um, I, I understand there is a different risk profile between large companies versus smaller organizations, as well as the sophistication of, you know, their resources and processes that they have in place already in those organizations. Um, so that will need to be taken into account um, uh, from uh, guidance um, for the audit um, and accreditation business rules, um, as well as um, uh, in the discretion as well of the auditor as well. So they need to understand the difference between um, the owner operator's business model um, versus um, a prime contractor who has hundreds of trucks. So, yeah. And that's a good segue to the next one as well from Robin. Um, who will be responsible for covering the costs of conducting aud audits at 20% of sites? So for a large national company, this will take weeks and incur considerable costs. Great question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, again, this this we haven't got to that yet. Um, that will be there will be a cost, obviously, for audits um, to be undertaken. Um, so um, that will be worked out um, in the next stages as the managing body is appointed. Um, and there will be um, basically a scalable um, uh, model that's that's uh, produced by that that body. So um, but there's still a lot of work to, to go on with that um, in terms of pricing and costs. And I think on that, I'd, I'd recommend uh, Robin just making sure we'd love to draw in some industry partners to the audit group to help guide that. Because one thing is yep. not to add a massive in cost and everything on, on the operation doing business to prove safety on that and to be very practical as well as what's reason. So um, yep. following this, would certainly invite you um, and a few of the other ones to come in and be part of the audit risk um, group to help take it all forward. Um, another question here from David. Um, zero OFIs is a high benchmark. Um, I get the NCRs, but question the OFIs. Any background on the position? So zero zero OFIs. Um, I'm just trying to might might want a little bit more elaboration on that one. So um, David, would you like to pose the question yeah. to to Michael? Yeah, sure. It just said that. You essentially to pass the audit, you needed zero NCRs and zero uh, OFIs. Uh, that's an unusual audit position. And, uh, okay. Um, uh, oh, Jerome, you're just sharing your um, 
outlook at the moment. Apologies, sorry. I just had an email, a question emailed through, sorry. And I think that also probably goes back to, you know, Robin's comment around the cost that all of a sudden you start to generate a side industry with orders yeah. to make a lot of money out of this. So, yeah. yeah, exactly, David. We don't want to do that. That's not the intent of this scheme. The intent of this scheme is for safety. Um, and we don't, yeah, we don't want to generate, um, as you said, yeah, a, a side uh, uh, industry here. Um, so just a bit of clarification, the OFIs, I believe um, were um, uh, went into the the accreditation um, stream. So if you go back in the slides, Jerome, I think um, we've got a. Uh, if you go to the, yeah, there. So, yeah. So sorry, that should say zero NCRs slash uh, OFIs, as in if there are OFIs, you 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 would oh, still yeah. be yeah accredited. Apologies if that was a bit hard to. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll look at rewording that um, a bit better. It's probably so, within yeah, the green box it says zero NCRs or OFIs. Or, to yeah, the correct. Audits. Yeah, yeah. So if they're, yeah, just to clarify, if there are OFIs um, picked up in the audits, that doesn't mean that um, you haven't um, met the standard. It just means that, yeah, there is cool. things that could be done to improve. So. I do apologize for my email. It came up and it was a question regarding it. So I thought I'd better have a look. So, um, but feeds back early. So, any other questions at all that people would like to pose? Because this is the high level and there's all the nuts and the bolts that fall in um, following this, Michael. So, one thing we'll put out as an invitation to a few industry people if you'd like to help up and um, help guide. Um, Definitely. This would be very good in the practical sense because. It needs to be very industry driven and is industry friendly. Um, yep. This isn't, isn't about, it's, the goal is to make life easier, more efficient, more reliable um, as it goes through, which is the whole point of what's been happening over in the UK. Cool. I think that's it for now. Um, so what we'll do now, um, the next one uh, I'm sort of responsible for delivering on talking to is the governance and sustainability uh, and membership of, of the program because one of the deliverables of it is creating the tra uh, the sustainable approach that's going to put this all in place and take it all forward. Um, so we had a bit of a working group uh, meeting among us in the steering group and had a, a quite a detailed discussion as to what, uh, which is the design, what should uh, the entity look like? and. Where we sort of landed as the first sort of step is the decision was made that at, at the start it should be set up with a governance structure and everything that's looking at as a program based approach. Once again, similar to um, Safe Load Program, NRSUP, um, the CLOCKS program over in the UK, but done in a way where if it's designed, if it was a transition out, there is the opportunity for it to come into its own sort of um, not for profit or those sort of entity, and that'll be up to the board. But taking the vision of everything that's put in place, it has that ability to do it. Um, the big thing, back to the point that David raised earlier, is is there's got to be a strong charter and um, agreement that's set in which underpins the program that doesn't allow the opportunity for exploitation, massive price hikes, all those sort of things. Because one of the big successes of the safe load program in the dangerous goods sector has been it's been so industry friendly um it's it's kept them on board and kept things moving forward and being extremely lean in doing so as is clocks in the uk so the goal would be is, is continuing on that sort of approach um, but the other part is it's got to be to the point of, of a couple of our um, partners anything that's do is it's got to give the reliability that um the standard is met it's put in place and um, gives peace of mind to the organizations that are crediting um, that they're going through and those delivering to their to their um, sites and working on the sites can can have those sort of elements. So the program um, is where the initial sort of stage will go um, and will govern design it. There'll be a board set up that will take it all forward um, and this will be drawing on the membership structure um, to take it all and provide the governance um, that's gone through. So we've sort of mapped out and designed a board structure um, which will be integrated into um, the design of the charter over the coming sort of uh, months. Um, and we'll sort of provide that in more detail at the uh, the next sort of workshop. Um, but as we've said, the setting up and setting up a not for profit uh, is quite an expensive and huge task at the moment. When obviously we just don't have the resources or ability to do that at the time. Um, but we're doing that with the vision of potentially doing it. And as another example of an organisation that's gone through that and and we're drawing learnings is the development and establishment of ANCAP, um, which was initially at RMS. 
um, and then transitioned itself out into its own stand standalone um, not for profit sort of entity as it is. So we're sort of not doing this in a vacuum. We're talking to the right sort of groups. We've had great discussions with Healthy Head Structure and Sheds and how they originated and uh, Lachlan Benson and putting the foundations of, of creating those sort of components and what learnings we can do. So the goal is 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 to draw all this together and to have something which can evolve should it be required into the future. This is basically the, the structure that we'll be taking forward. And I know a lot of people have sort of been seeing this um, as it hasn't really changed much, um, but the key sort of component will be it will sit across into from a host organization of some form. Um, it will basically be its own entity within that. Um, you'll have a board that will sit over the program um, and get provide the governance and everything moving forward. Um, and then coming off that will be the audit group, um, which has heard Michael talk about at the moment. And, um, and once again, we're opening that to invitations to, to be part of um, there's a consolidation group that sits over that's going to pull together all the different technical group standards and elements um, that can feed in and keep that continuous improvement moving forward and then off the side will be the formalization of supporting partners and clock say champions within the program and recognizing where they sit and what level they are as well and then how they integrate back into the broad program all these technical groups will once again be continuously improving and moving forward and um, we'll be sitting in in those um, within the program, have their own chairs um, and those sort of technical groups to keep those sort of things improving um, and moving along. And once again, any whoops, any groups within the Clocksa um, Champions program will be able to draw through and provide into those sort of groups as well. Because once again, it's all about being very um, consolidated, uh, about being very uh, consultative in moving things forward. Um, and we want to make sure it's industry driven. Um, that the standards are evolving and take reflecting those sort of things that may come in over time. So to underpin it, um, this is sort of what we're sort of looking at the moment is a bit of a membership sort of structure. Um, when we're sort of looking around, we've looked at a range of organisations such as, as, as Safer Together, Road Australia, other sort of bodies, a um, number of different programs that sit out there and sort of drawn on the sort of learnings that, that goes through and what's the best way to do it. So um, what we sort of look, look at me measuring it up is within each of these sort of tiers, um, having a varying level, so um, depending on the size of the company, reflect that in the, um, what the membership model fee would be for the program. Um, and that would then flow through and provide the underpinning, I guess, base load uh, for the program. Um, as discussed earlier, there'll be some form of auditing or check certification that goes through. Um, that, will have, that will basically be a fixed amount similar to the safe load program. Um, the other discussion was then looking around having some form of training of VAU or guidance that sort of sits there and can provide those sort of um, elements where required to support it. Um, and then basically the tiers for government might be uh, differing levels depending upon, um, I guess, the, the funding elements that flow into. So quite often government, uh, Commonwealth and state are the major enablers for some of the major projects. Um, I think we should look at what's happening across the East Coast with uh, the nearly um, $230 billion worth of infrastructure projects that are in the pipeline um, and then sort of smaller tier down for the local um, local go uh, government sort of tier at the sort of the lower level to bring them in. Um, the vested interest could be all sorts of different groups that have um, an idea of their passion about road safety or constru um, construction safety areas like that and they can sort of be involved and recognised as a uh, supporting partner of the program. And then philanthropy may be someone who has been or been involved or touched by road trauma in some way or an organisation that wants to step up or even could even be other elements that can feed feed into that. Um, one thing which is emerging a bit more, which isn't philanthropy, um, but could be also enforceable undertakings which have taken place in the sector, which could flow back into the program, um, which we haven't touched on in there as well. But that's what we're looking at for the for the membership sort of structure of the program. Um, and that's what's sort of proposed at the moment as it sort of goes out. As mentioned, the key thing is is also then is going out and finding a new home um, for where the program will go. What we'll be doing is establishing a selection panel um, and we're just going to we're about to begin sort of uh, locking down seed funding to get it up and going um, in the initial sort of phases of, of its life, what's mo moving itself forward. We'll go through and develop the EOI and what the key selection criteria will be. Um, I'm, and for the why, I'm confirming with Osroads at the moment, and they're quite open to being used as the channel to get the um, the expressions of interest out to become the host, um, and they because they have a very strong, secure, um, and a broad network which can is issue it. 
um, which will go through and any organization will be able to tender to, to host the program um, and we can find in its right sort of home. Um, once we've gone through and an issue has been confirmed, um, we can also discuss it, share insights with any of those that may be looking at um, uh, doing submissions. We'll have a clear date for locking and closing it off, which we'll, which we'll be locking down and mapping out shortly. Um, and then from that, we'll be going through a selection process. And the final stage is really, we'll be just providing the preferred host to NHVR to, to agree that's where the home will go. Um, and then the letter of agreement will be issued to take it all forward. Um, and then from that point, we'll be then transfer timelines into the new sort of host with all the elements that support it. So um, that's what on the governance. Any questions uh, that people would like to ask or throw or even idea bursts, which may have been missed or not considered? Great. I'll move on then if there's any other sort of comments. So just the other elements of the program, um, following on from today's session, we'll circulate the PowerPoint and draft standard as mentioned, and we'll also do a link into the video for this as well, so you can all draw on. Um, at the moment, we just sort of thought, look, um, and, and this is to be confirmed as well, we're looking at maybe six weeks and then some more detailed stuff in the new year, but the goal will be if we can draw everything in, um, consolidation feedback um, and we'll also send this on to some of the big associations for their comments so they're sort of aware of it the approach will be very much along the way where how Osroads puts a lot of their sort of papers out you know, I guess to the the members um, where we'll be looking at logging and tagging all the sort of feedback that's provided what's been provided um, what it was where it related to um, and then we'll be documenting how that's sort of been addressed on the side so um, that's the sort of key components and then the goal will be the next workshop we'll be looking at finalising. But the key goal really is, is we're going to make this as, as consultative as possible moving forward um, and integrate all sort of feedback um, that can go through uh, and test it all. So um, this is the correct timeline that we're sort of looking at. We'll be then looking at a finalisation workshop for March 22nd um, with the next sort of major stage. So we can sort of close, I guess, the feedback out and then there may be some targeted consultation between the March 22nd and once we've sort of closed out the feedback with different sort of groups to really get their inputs as required. Um, and then the goal is to have everything sort of finalised out by sort of June the 3rd uh, that's going to be done at the end. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge the steering group uh, who've been helping guide this all forward. Uh, we've been meeting monthly sort of evolved and changed a little bit as personnel or organizations and people change but um, this is the I guess the latest uh, steering group that's been taking it all forward um, I'd like to particularly acknowledge in there I guess Michael Holmes has been the, the co-chair helping take it all forward which has been fantastic but none of this group uh, they've all taken leadership position in the technical groups which has been spectacular I am aware Michael Chan is stepping down as chair and, and um, in his role as he's got a new role uh, moving forward so Great, big thanks to, to Michael Chan. Um, for some reason, uh, Chris Luce has also decided uh, to go off to be to retire. So um, thank you to Chris uh, for his great support. And he's been passing the reins over to Paul, um, who's gonna be taking over in that sort of area as well. I know Greg Crane has also been stepping up into a greater role um, stepping back. So there's always those changes over a long-term project. Um, so huge thanks to that to the group and to everyone um everyone has contributed from this and been very active um so these are their organizations which have been very strong in taking this forward and as you can see transport for london is, is one of the ones sort of sits inside and is recognized as the mou moving forward um and then we have a whole lot of supporting partners as well which i've got to sing out these are ones who have signed on to the mou um just to demonstrate i guess their tangible support for um, clock say uh, over over its as we've been developing as well. And any organisation can sign on to it as well. Um, feel free if you have not. We certainly would invite you to be part of it. So that is the end of today. But I'll open it up in case anyone else would like to add any other comments or questions they would like to uh, to throw out. <clears throat> Jerome, it's Merv Rollins here. Can you yeah, hear me? I can um, just a, a sort of a, a more general question about the whole scheme. We've got, uh, you know, we're proposing different levels of, uh, you know, bronze, uh, silver and gold. And um, depending on the particular infrastructure project 
that we're dealing with at the time and the projects will have different levels and ratings that they'll require. How do we deal with um, an operator who may qualify for, you know, gold level logistics and silver level driver training, but only have bronze level trucks? What does he get? Is it just the minimum of, you know, whichever is the, the, um, the lowest ranked element of their business? I would say it would go to the lowest rank, wouldn't you agree, Michael? Yeah, I think it would be the lowest rank. Um, and when having a look at the Clocks UK standard and, and also the fours, well, the fours is actually the standard that has the bronze, silver, gold progression. That's how it works. And then there is obviously, you know, uh, an agreed time frame for progression up up the tier. If, if you are, for example, if you're applying for silver or if you're applying for gold, um, you have to be making genuine attempts to get to there. Otherwise, um, yeah, it, it's sort of, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really make sense if you're awarding someone gold, um, but they haven't met the standard. Um, so that's basically how the model works in the, the UK's fours um, accreditation. And, and, and we've got to be realistic on this as well. Like we're not expecting everyone to be able to jump straight up to it. I think one of the strengths, I know talking yeah. with um, Mark Noble at Wholesome and some of the other sort of groups as well, like, they have a plan to go through to upskill to get those sort of vehicles to go through um, and you can't sit there and say all right we've got everyone's go through this driver training but if the driver training isn't available and you can't get it all going and um, yep. you can't get all your drivers through it but you have to show reasonable steps actually progressing so there's got to be the practical components in it to what's realistic at the same time so if you're a very large company like a, a, a Hanson and um, you know, you might have a thousand trucks out there working for you who are partially company trucks and, and part contractors. Um, and you're not going to get every truck up to that level or every driver up to that level, because a lot of them are in fact your drivers. Um, mm -hmm. You, if, if it's a silver level uh, infrastructure project that, and, and, and the, the company needs to be at silver level, can it just supply trucks and drivers who are at that level without having to have the entire company at that level? Yeah. I think I think that sounds quite reasonable. I think so. um, yeah, and, and it's exactly what happened down here. I think once again, I'll, I'll use Wholesome as, as the example. I know they fitted a lot of their trucks with the left uh, left turn audible squawker, and they put it initially just on the projects that were servicing the Melbourne Metro project because it's a requirement, but didn't have it on all the other projects. But it didn't then. I, and because none of those other trucks serviced it, it was, it was never a problem. I think that's got to be that practical side that comes into it. Um, that being said, I think the learning that eventuated is they finished up putting on all the trucks as a result. But I think it's got to be always pragmatic into everything that we do um, and, the, and common mm -hmm. sense. And if, it, if, if at any stage, I think industry, anyone can put this back, if you can't sit there and if it falls, something stumbles over because it hasn't ticked the common sense box, then we shouldn't be it shouldn't be going into this sort of approach. And that that um, particular, uh, I guess this particular topic is something as well that, um, you know, is for discussion um, with the steering group and, and the clocks A members as well. So um, that'll feature within the standard. So. A great question, Merv. I think and uh, and I hope that I hope that puts it because I know that was the question from Robin up earlier um, was also sort of talk about all the sites and all those sort of components. I think that that's that got to be that degree of sort of common sense, and I hope that puts puts Robin's mind at ease a bit as well. Are there any other questions that people or comments? I think that that's a great one. Is there anything we've missed? No. There's no more questions in the chat. Either that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> so we'll either get a lot more, but um, please do take the time uh, to provide comments and, and feedback. And if you want to nominate to be part of any of the technical groups or you wish to be part of um, the auditing, please do um, reach out. We want to always make sure we're open to comments um, and questions. And this is really just draft one version of the standard. Um, and I think it will go through and review. Uh, I know I've got an email to, uh, to look at um, on, on the comments after this as well as, as an example, and there'll be a few of them. Um, and, I, and I'll give an undertaking to everyone. If you do provide comments, um, they will be integrated 
and we'll make sure that it's also we'll show how we responded to them as well. So it's very, very inclusive. Sure, I'm sorry, it's Merv Rollins again. Just a comment in case I missed it in any of the presentations. One of the tasks that we have to do is develop a process for the, um, you know, those running these infrastructure projects to rate their project as bronze, silver or gold. Yep, that's correct. And so that's, that's something that it, 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 it's, and I know if you've been talking to Ian about that and others as well, it's very much going to be, I think, drawing on aspects from the other ones. And if there are any people who would like to to help, and as, as we try to indicate, we try not to make this um, resource intensive anyone. It's more very consultative. If you'd like to have input into how to select or valuable insights on developing that tool, um, we'd be greatly appreciated because we want to make that as once again common sense and doing it all. So, um, Merv, I think we can have a chat offline following up from this now. So, heads coming up to, but I would open it up to the group and I'll include that in the summary as an invitation for some of these areas where we've got some focused works coming on and we would love some experts to come in to provide input. Are you happy with that, Merv? Yeah, no, sounds good. If we can, you know, have input from uh, as many who've been involved in running these big projects, uh, who've got a good understanding of what the variables are that uh, affect um, uh, heavy vehicle and vulnerable road user safety on a job, um, then we'd love to love to hear from them. So we understand the different things, uh, the different factors that we need to take into account when um, we try to uh, quantitatively rate a project. Awesome. Thank you, Merv. And, and once again, appreciate all the great comments, uh, kind words from everyone. Um, we'll continue the consultative process of moving this all forward. Uh, if there's no other comments, we'll close it all out. So last, uh, and we're giving you some more of your time, your day back. It's not very often you get a workshop that goes and nice and tight to the point. No? All right, I'll take that as a, as a great break. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll follow up and circulate to everyone as discussed. So have a great day and uh, take care out on the roads. Thank you, and Michael, as well. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.